All right. Uh, we are officially live. Hello. 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 Uh, <laughs> Oh boy, I I feel like a British mod when you say it like that. Yeah, hello, governor. Hello. What's oh. all going on here then? Hey, it is a a right smart haircut, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So welcome everyone. Yeah. Doug and Bo come correct. Uh, if you have been paying attention, and God help you if you have. Um, <laughs> we are doing all of the Pink Panther movies. Yes, and we have come to chapter three. Yeah, only the third movie, and and wow, bro, wow! Oh, it just sucked the life right out of you. Um, yeah, I yeah. warned you. I did warn you in advance. Yeah. I, you know, I, so I was having breakfast this morning with my lovely lady friend. We mm -hmm. met for breakfast, and uh, what'd you have? What'd you have? Uh, I, you know, I'm a simple man, Duncan. It was, it was like, uh, eggs sunny side up, some toast, some bacon, yep. Yep. some hash browns with oh. tomato and pepper and mm. yeah, it was quite good. Sounds delicious. It was I wonderful. Had, I had no breakfast. I had a coffee. I, I also had coffee. Usually my oh. breakfast is like, uh, like fruit and some toast is mm. generally the, how I roll. Cause I've been trying to shed some pounds and whatnot. Uh, but this morning, you know, she was like, Hey, or actually last night she was like, Hey, you want to meet at Rudy's, which is a little like hole in the wall diner nearby. Yeah. Like you want to meet there for breakfast tomorrow and get away from the fucking kids for a little bit. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, also her parents are staying with her. It's a whole thing. Yeah. And also like, uh, just say you can't walk into a diner and say, I I'll have some toast and fruit please. Because I believe they burn you both. Yeah. Uh, they they so. just take. Some grease from the fryer in a coffee cup and fling it right. right at you. How about a little fire scarecrow? And <laughs> so, so we, yeah, so we ate there. And I, but I was telling her, I was like, yeah, you know, um, oh. I've been watching all these Pink Panther movies, uh, as she knows. And I was like, I watched that Inspector Clouseau movie last night, and it was rotten, rough, rough. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, I wish it were rough. I wish there had been a dog. Um, <laughs> it's um, it's like yeah, but we will get into it. But as a movie, completely devoid of humor. Yeah, I mean the last per hour chart, uh, which was pretty strong with a shot in the dark. That was alright. Yeah, yeah, and it will only go up in the next one. I guarantee it. But this one here is just like, why we just have nothing. Yeah, it's like a half a laugh per hour. I think I inadvertently yeah. laughed once at something Alan Arkin did. Um, yeah, but Weird. anyway. Before yes. we get into all that, we've got other business to take care Rushing of. Rushing ahead of ourselves here. Yeah. What are we doing? Yeah, it's right. Like, what, get to the meat of the show right away? Are you stupid? Never. We don't do that. No. Oh, we force our listeners to hear us talk about other movies. Yes. Um, and uh, if, if this is the first time listening to the show, uh, you know, it was, it was nice having you. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll never come back not after this also episode. also what person is like what person is trolling the internet desperate to find out what me and you think of inspector close from 1968 you would be shocked <laughs> you'd be shocked i just don't hear enough people talking about my favorite close movie <laughs> i want yeah like the seo on this is gonna be real bottom of the barrel <laughs> <laughs> no but yeah you're right how many people like when i googled inspector clouseau and and found the movie it like threw up a prompt window that said are you sure yeah i was like yeah i really do want to watch this all right yeah and a lot of people don't know this movie exists and that is bliss please stay there yeah yeah it's <laughs> Right. It's like those people who were in a coma for the entire Trump presidency. Like, you just don't even want to tell them about it. <laughs> what? What happened? The guy that you, was... You guys voted too? Yeah. The, the the guy who did the whole your fire thing and said, yeah. grab him by the pussy. You elected yeah. him? Yeah. yeah. Right, so. Yeah. So I did that. that and, and that didn't turn out well. All right. Oh. Yeah. And there was a whole armed <laughs> insurgency? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as it yeah. happens. Yeah, um, just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you know, for those of you who who don't know what Inspector Clouseau is, uh, God bless you, and yeah. it'll uh, we'll we'll bring that. To Listen to but... us, and yeah. Don't do it. Yeah, and and it'll be shorter than the movie. Uh, oh god, yeah. and yeah. and because 
there are only like five things that happen in the plot. So we're, we're going to, yeah. I, I don't say right, we're not going to rush through it because there is some stuff to goof on with yes. that movie that I, I want to talk to you about because there's some stuff that happened. that was like, well, here's the thing I need to put in the memory banks to chat with Duncan about because this yeah. is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, including the haircut of our lead oh, Johnny Rainbow. Yeah. Yeah, Johnny Rainbow. Um, <laughs> you know, there, was, there was a point in the writing of that movie where they just didn't give a fuck anymore, did they? <laughs> like, yeah, and it was it was day one. <laughs> like, it was he's an arch villain. Let's call him Johnny. And one of them was looking at the window and was like Rainbow. It was like Usual Suspects, but shiter. Yeah, uh, was like, I, well, it was like that's. Uh, I mean, again, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but that that opening <laughs> stupid airplane joke. Yeah, that whole series of gags think, where you're like, oh, if this is what we're in for, that's it. That's that's the like. The, there's the, there's a challenge for anyone that doesn't believe us and how bad the movie is. Watch the opening four minutes, and if you crack a smile, then one, you're fucking wrong. Um, <laughs> and like, you're you're on the spectrum. Yeah, and, and you can continue on with that movie. Chances are, you just found a new favorite movie. But if you don't crack a smile. That's about the level of the humor. It doesn't really go above that at all, all the way through it. And that is, uh, yeah, it really just kind of shits the bed right at the start and then kind of rubs your face in it like a puppy's. Yeah. Um, so. Which you're not even supposed to do, I found. No, 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 never, never do that. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole point is like you have to catch them while they're doing it. Yes. And and that'll change the behavior. But if you yeah. just rub them, post, they, they, but they don't understand why, why you're doing that. Right. Yeah. If, if you do it 20 minutes later and you're just rubbing yeah. their face in poop, they're like, why they're like, are, what is this about? What, what, like, I thought we had an agreement here. Yeah. I've moved on with my life. The, the pooping <laughs> yeah. happened 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're mad by this, wait to see what I've done in the other room. Um, so <laughs> oh, you made me dribble a little bit. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, let, let's talk about some movies, good and bad, because I'm I'm really excited to talk about both of mine uh-huh. uh, this week. So you let did me you, know did, how you want to get started. Did, did, did you did you did you go and see it? Did I go and see what? Did you see the orphan movie? Oh hell yeah, I did. Oh my! Like I I almost I almost applauded it when it finished. So, all right, all right, dude. Let, all right, so <laughs> we'll just jump into it. That's my good for this week is orphan. Oh, first it's, it is absolutely the most fucking entertaining movie yes. I've seen this year in the cinema. I, I was I, like, I was howling with laughter. I mean, Dude. like, actually howling with laughter during this movie. It's fucking brilliant. Yeah, that, all right. So we're going to dance around spoilers on this one, but I will obviously have the the time code in fact let me make a note of the time code right now so yeah. that I don't. so so if you want if you don't want any spoilers for or- orphan first skill and i recommend that the less you know about the movie going into it the better yeah. off you are there, there's certain things that you will know because it's a prequel right, right. so you like, know for example yes. the orphan doesn't die in it right so yeah. because she's in the next movie but 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 yeah. aside from that there there is stuff that we will at least allude to in this conversation <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have, the time code is there. Skip ahead yep. to to the next uh, time code. So yep. uh, it, it's in the notes, uh, et cetera. Yeah, the, at this point, if you're still listening to this chat, you fucked up if you've not seen the right. movie. Okay, so I I can't agree with you. Like, this is immediately rocketing to the top of my, like, 10 best of the year list, <laughs> I which is crazy because I watched Orphan recently, <laughs> the original Orphan. Yeah. And I was like, you know, this is a little overlong. It it it's it's a little too serious, a little too self serious. I also I also kinda on rewatches it maybe doesn't hold up once you know what the twist is. Yeah, and you know well I mean like I don't know if you knew like because I remember when the first one came out. I remember hearing there's a big reveal, but I don't know if I knew when I was sitting down to watch it that that's what the reveal was. I mean, you could kind of work it out. Um, and the movie doesn't make a huge attempt to try and hide it either. But at the same time, I'd like, when you revisit it, you're right. The tone of it is just it's a, a very, very, very serious movie, which doesn't necessarily merit the. That was the one thing maybe Slasher did right. If, if, if it did anything right, was it went so fucking camp. Yeah, with the with the orphan story, which makes me think someone watched Slasher and then decided to make Orphan First Kill. So if that's you know, like if that's what happened, then that is the only credit I will ever give Aaron Martin on this show. The only credit at all. Yeah. yeah. So I agree with you though about about the first Orphan because watching it again and knowing what the trick of the movie is. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like all right, yeah, it's 
if this were if this movie were ninety minutes long, it would be it would be much better. Yes. Instead of like right at two hours, uh, it's it's just and it's you know uh, what's his name, Juame, call it Sarah. Yes, uh, directed it, and I mean it's just it, it's directed as though it's an honest to goodness horror movie. Yeah. And it, but it's also such a schlocky idea. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Orphan First Kill gets right is it understands how ridiculous the premise is. A hundred percent. And uh, also shelves that reveal right in the fucking start. Absolutely. Like, you know, from jump, it, it, it presumes you have seen Orphan. Yeah. So it does and as a result, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't like gauge you halfway through the film before you get another reveal. It's like, no, 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 no. We're just right. Here she's here. She's in an insane asylum. She's a con artist. Oh, by the way, she looks like a kid, but she's actually a 39 year old woman. Yeah. Let's go. And, right. And so the, the first, what, half hour of the movie feels like a, they're just redoing. So 100%, even, even tonally. Yeah. It's a very serious kind of setting up what you will expect to be a kind of creepy, potentially home invasion -y slash stock kill horror movie. Yes. And and then about the half an hour mark, about, about just dribbling at the 40 minute mark, there is a, a reveal. Yeah. And at that point, I was like, oh, 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 oh that's right. I was like, oh, please, 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 please just keep doing this. And then the movie's like, oh, you like that? Well, you're gonna fucking love this, yeah. and it got it like it, it was almost like, like it was like imagine you're playing Jenga, but what you're removing it is ridiculous subplots and stacking it on top, and somehow your Jenga tower manages to stay erectable. Yeah. So like, it's like but, how much can we put on here before it's too much? And I was like, keep going, keep going, keep going. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. You're I mean, you're totally right. It the thing that's beautiful about Orphan First Kill. And the way I, I I was talking to somebody in the Discord group about this, and the comparison I made, I was like, it's like somebody saw Orphan and then sold the rights to the Lifetime Movie Network, and it got pushed through that filter of, yeah. like, how can we make this just outrageous and crazy? Yeah. And, and that turn in the movie when you realize, like, oh, it's not going to be a retread of Orphan. It's not just going to be another slasher movie. Yeah. I mean, it kind of is, but but not really. Uh, and, and you realize, like, oh, the fact that she is the Orphan is yes. only part of this puzzle. Yeah. It, it is the smartest thing you could do with this story. Yeah. It is done, like, Julia Stiles is having so much fun in this She movie. is, like, she is back. Like, I, I loved her. Like, see when she was, like, around the first time and everyone was kind of clamoring over her and she did, like, 10 things I hear about you and stuff like that. And I thought she was great then. And then she had a small, like, kind of blip back to being kind of somewhat interesting as an actress in Dexter. She plays a great role in, in, in Dexter TV show. And then she's kind of dosed about a little bit. And she's a great actress, and mm -hmm. you can tell it here because she knows exactly the level of hamming up she needs to do, yeah. and she fucking nails it. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing. This movie is camp yeah. oh, in, God, in oh, so all camp. the right ways. Oh, so it is camp. so. But my biggest complaint with the whole movie is that the the fire CGI at the end is pretty dodgy. Yeah. But that's but... kind of it. And like, yeah. it's hard to it's hard to praise it as like this is a legitimate serious horror movie because it's it, not it's not and like, like I got, i've got a stress here right i've got a stress it it makes a couple of like it, it makes a couple of leaps mm -hmm. which defy all sense and all logic sure narratively sure. specifically narratively yeah. um and it kind of because of its runtime as well which is a perfect runtime yeah it's it like 95 minutes yeah yeah, it's in and out. Um, it takes so long setting up that first 40 minutes that the back half is very rushed, but then the back half is the bit that really is kind of shaky, narratively speaking. So we have to kind of it's like a it's like a bridge that you're not quite sure if it can hold your weight. You yeah. sprint over that. You don't you don't like you don't like slowly saunter over, you fucking run over it. Right. And the movie understands that as well. So I could never in any good conscience say it's a good movie because like and there's so many things where I'm like that. If you think about it for like two minutes, it kind of falls apart. But in terms of, right, this is what this movie is. We don't want to do that movie again. Uh, quite a bit of time has moved on. 
and we're going to do a prequel about it, then let's let's just let's just entertain the audience because that the serious movie, quote unquote serious movie, is definitely coming. And it's all you know, it's so different in a lot of respects that it becomes its own thing. It's the same. I was I, we were talking about this outside because Baz went to see it at the cinema. Baz fucking hated it. Oh, that's Absolutely. nuts. He was like, at one point he, he actually went fuck you in middle fight like two middle fingers at the screen um at a particular line maybe with like a held at the I could, like about five minutes I couldn't stop laughing when Julius tells us like that I'm gonna go and fuck my husband dude <laughs> it is you know since you've been back he's he's really come alive in bed so I have to thank you for like that whole sequence was oh, so dude. good. It, oh, because man. it's just trash <clears throat> like it's shock and trash but in the best possible way a hundred percent but like the way this movie kind of reminded me of is like that stranger sequel mm-hmm. right so the like, strangers very serious movie very well, i don't really like it but it's a very serious movie it's you know it's well regarded it's you know like often is still a well regarded movie um and you know it's all those things and now you're going to do another one are you just going to make that movie again, or are you just going to make it the most exaggerated version that you could? And that's what there's in the second one. It becomes a big neon splashed, ultra pulpy slasher movie, which is not the tone of the first movie. And that's basically what they did here. They're like that we've got that first one. If we're going to do another one, let's just go for entertainment. And by God, did they nail it? Like I, I honestly had a fucking ball with it i i was smiling from year to year so much so like i come out listen to mine i was like that you know i'm gonna buy that movie oh uh, yeah yeah absolutely and you know i was telling maya about it. i was like i know this isn't really your kind of film mm. but i would love to watch this with you sometime because yeah. it's just so much fun you know <laughs> it's, it like once you again once you get to the point where the movie becomes something other than a retread yeah. of the original yeah. The whole back end of it is just, it, it just terrific. I mean, and yeah. and and I like the fact that the front thirty is what it is, so that when you make that tonal shift, it's like, oh, thank you. This is just, uh, like I thought it was going to be a cheap retread of the original, yeah. even up until the 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 moment that things become something else entirely. Yeah, and once that happens, I. I couldn't have been more on board. I was like, oh, we're doing this. Okay, great. And it, and like you said, it just, it keeps kind of twisting that knife where strangely, yeah. the orphan is kind of the hero of the movie in a lot that's of ways. The, that's the thing that's so like audacious about it. Yeah. Because once again, if you've seen, like sequels can try this sometimes where like we're, we're going to carry on with this. I think it's not as black and gray with slasher killers um, you end up rooting for the slasher killer but they never like in a franchise but they never really become likeable characters like Jason is never a likeable character yeah. but you want to see him gut some teenagers you know <laughs> it's, like, that's kind of the level that you're in um, but then you get a whole swath of them of um, kind of modern horror franchises trying to do the same thing and kind of failing like the idea that anyone would try and humanise Jigsaw has always confused the fuck out of me like by by giving us more backstory, oh, he, it, oh, the cancer was really bad, and his wife was pregnant, but she got punched in the belly. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah. like all, all that pitch, and the same with Don't Breathe, um, which had its sequel what last year, yeah. where they tried to, they tried to basically make the rapist character, uh, the, you know, the blind rapey character, the hero, question mark, um. And I, I have issues with that, but in the case of this one, where the subject matter is so overtly campy, like, D- Don't Breathe 2 is a serious fucking horror movie, um, and that's why it kind of doesn't work. But in this one, it's just like, it's just all bells, whistles, over-the-top, n- over-the-top nonsense, and mm-hmm. I am I am just, like, I am there for that. So yeah, I was, um, <clears throat> and this was unexpected because this is from a director that doesn't hold a yeah. great track record did, for me. Did he the really boy doesn't. and where? I mean, a couple of movies that are like okay. The devil inside. Oh, he did right. The devil inside. Yeah. Right. So that he will always wear that as a cloud of stink around him for me because I sat through that movie and that ending happened, Bo, and I was like, "What the fuck did we just do here?" Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's real bad, but yeah, I and I, 
it, and same with the writer, a, a writer that hasn't necessarily done a lot of great stuff either. Yeah. But something about this combination, it just totally worked. Like they got it. It's yeah. wonderful. That's yeah. there is a, a moment where, and I'm sure you'll remember this, where uh, Esther slash Lena is is kind of fleeing a scene. Yeah. Gets in an SUV. Oh, breaks up dude. the music and lights up a cigarette. Puts You're on like, the massive Jackie O sunglasses, yeah. lights up a cigarette, does a, does the lipstick, and uh -huh. then she's driving like a gangster. Yeah. It's the fucking greatest thing ever. It was so good, man. I was I, like clapping my Dorito stained flippers together. It was just, it was so <laughs> much fun. I had such a good time with that movie. Yeah. And it may be the most fun I've had watching a movie this year. It's the thing that I think. Like when we talk about, and I, I'm going to link back to it again, but when we talk about Slasher, the TV show, that's what I want from Slasher, the TV show. Yeah, yeah That yeah, level yeah. of camp, and you never get it. You never, like, it takes itself too seriously. Um, and as a result, it doesn't work. See if I had, like, four seasons of stuff like that on that level of camp, 100% in with it. Yeah. It's a movie that weirdly gets, and I, I weirdly anticipated... I think what the audience actually deserves to see in an orphan sequel, as opposed to trying to give them the same thing again. So, right. Yeah. yeah. The, the, a ton of fun, man. The easiest thing in the world would, would have literally been to remake orphan. Oh God. Yeah. And, and just do like, Oh, this is her, the first family that she was with where the same shit happened. Yeah. And, we, we literally yeah. do like, uh, like the, like the, like the TV show, the Hulk, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. like the end of the thing, she's walking down the road with a thumb out. Um, yeah. we, could, we could have easily done something like that where you could spin up those as well as prequels. You know, how many, like, these are all the cases or all the rest. And I'm so glad that they didn't do that. I'm so glad that they went the way they did. And even then, I mean, in terms of backstory to the character, was it actually added? Nothing. And that's the yeah. kind of best thing about it. It actually weirdly didn't add any massive sense of of lack of continuity to that character. Like, they didn't yeah. try and front load it with, the, well, this happened. Like, the worst thing they could have done is a full-on origin story. You know what I mean? And they don't. they like, all that bad shit happened to her in the past. Here she's in the same asylum right at the start. Go. And, um, yeah, man, yeah. I'd like, so entertaining. Like, so entertaining. And we we need more of that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's one of those movies that when you, yeah, just like we did now, when you run into someone who has seen it. Yeah. You're just like, oh my God, let's just talk about how how bananas it was. And, and it's, how the, it's the it was. It's, yeah, it's the bit it's the revealing the plot that we yeah. can't mention here. But when that happened, I genuinely like you could like I would yeah. love to have seen like like a recording of my face because I was literally watching it going, this has been all right so far. And then the reveal came and I was like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it was do, it yeah, it's a total Huh? Huh? I was like, you know? are we doing this? And then I like in the back of my head, I was like, I'll just keep doing this. Please just keep doing it. Like, don't don't like don't do like a yeah. like a silly fake reveal thing or something. Just keep doing this. And then it just le it leans so hard and so full into the nonsense that I I just uh I, yeah. Easily one of the most but, entertaining things I've seen this year. Yeah, I like the fact that you reach a point where there's only one character in yeah. this house who doesn't know what's happening and every everybody is trying to keep this facade yes. just to protect him. Yep. And and it all goes up. And anyway, it's terrific. Anyway, so do, do you have another good movie other than the truly excellent Orphan First Kill to talk hey, about? Hey, so, yeah, so I've, um, <clears throat> I have in the last, oh, I did see Nope, by the way, um, in the interim since we last recorded and thought that was excellent. So, yeah, um, it's, it, the more I've thought about it, the more I've liked it. Although, yeah, I, initially, I, think it's, I was like, eh. Yeah. I think it's an excellent movie. I think I think there's too many people. Maybe I'm guilty of this. I'm certainly guilty of this when it comes to us, which I found was just an okay movie. Yeah. Um. You know, he's never going to make Get Out again, nor should he make Get Out again. He's done that. Yeah. He's he's made that movie. But in terms of massive spectacle, cinema movies go. Um. It reminded me. It so reminded me of things like Jaws. Like, see when you get to a bit where they're building all the constructions to try and capture a thing. All that was going through my head is this is just, like, I was just waiting for the swashbuckling, like, John Williams score to kick in, because I'm like, well, that's, that's what we're doing here. And he's doing it really fucking well. So I'd seen that, but 
I suppose the other one I want to mention is I got a couple of screeners through from Fright Fest. Mm-hmm. So, uh, which is, Bright Fest is happening in London just now, so tons of shit's happening down there. But I've got a couple of movies that Arrow are going to be distributing, and a chance to chat to some directors. Um, so this is a twofer, and I'm going to do them both very, very quick. Uh, the first one is The Leech. Um, it's directed by Eric Pennycroft. Uh, he has uh, got Graham Skipper in the lead role alongside Jeremy Gardner. Uh, Jeremy Gardner is fucking brilliant in it surprise surprise and it is a christmas horror movie but is a christmas horror movie in the vein of a horror movie you've never seen before in your entire life so like you know what you get with christmas horror movies because it's either gonna be a slasher or something supernatural or something along those lines the simple premise is graham skipper is a priest who has a very dwindling flock and he's trying he's very pious, he's trying to preach it like the Lord's work and how you should be giving and all the rest. And one day in his one of his sermons at the very few people there, there is a redneck uh Jeremy Gardner who appears to be homeless, who kind of takes advantage of him and manages to swindle his way into staying temporarily at Skipper's home. Um and the skipper is forced to practice what he preaches, which is forgiveness turning the other cheek and being uh, an accommodating host in the face of someone who is utterly reprehensible. Um, and then there's more shenanigans that flow out from it. It is it's like it takes a wicked turn, man. It's a ton of fun. So that one. Uh, and the second one was a, a documentary that should be available, hopefully, on the Arrow Player for the end of the year, which is called Orchestrator of Storms, the Fantastic World of Jean Roland. So this is like a two-hour doc on the works of infamous French um Euro cult cinema filmmaker Jean Roland. And it follows his life, um, and it's fucking excellent because I know, I I'd like I know a handful of genre land movies, and they're all like even if I don't, they're kind of they're like really really arty Jess Franco movies. Yeah, it's like, kind of like, soft core French or lots of yeah. soft lighting and yeah, yeah, Technicolor and it's yes, yeah, super it's, interesting. Like, yeah, yeah, um, but like I obviously I don't deep dive know his movies, and he made a lot of fucking movies, and this follows basically his life from um, you know being a, a kid whose mother was like not a prostitute, but she she wasn't far off it, and she slept with basically all these bohemian artists. Um, who were kind of in and out of Roland's life as he was a kid um, up to when he decided he wanted to be a filmmaker and then like that lands right at the time that you have the, the kind of first new wave of French cinema coming out so it's all very left wing very political and all the rest and he's friends with all these directors and he could easily just toe the line by being anti-establishment and making these movies, which are immensely popular. And he decides to be anti-establishment by making like erotic horror movies. And you, you basically you follow his life through the movies he was doing when he is maybe at his peak, which was never he was never a famous filmmaker. Um, and you kind of follow him through to like essentially his tragedy at the end so it's it's fucking brilliant the research they did in it was nuts um and it's brilliant but there's a there's a great bit in the middle and i was talking to the directors about this where they talk about um like basically pornography was banned in france for like about almost a decade and when the ban got lifted just everyone started making hardcore porn just everyone was like let's make lot let's flood the market with porn 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 and uh, Sean Roland decided he was going to do it. He'd always been kind of con- scutting around the erotic stuff. And he made it, so he made a full-on, and I need to, like, find this fucking movie, um, full-on half-horror, half-porn movie. And it played, and uh, the description you mentioned in the documentary is people that went there for titillation were confused, and people that went there to see a horror movie were also confused. So mm-hmm. it basically didn't play to either market well. Yeah. Like, they're, like, everyone was just like... I, 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 is this, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Am I supposed to be scared? Am I supposed to be touching myself? I don't know what's happening here. Um, so it's, it's a great documentary. It's called The Orchestrator of Storms, which is from his biography. It's how he, he, he said that when he saw his very first movie when he was like eight on the big screen, he decided he wanted to be a filmmaker. He wanted to be an orchestrator of storms. Um, 
So it's, it's fascinating. It's just under two hours long. It's coming to the Arrow player, I think, before the end of the year. The Leech is definitely coming before the end of the year. It's coming out in November on the Arrow player, and everyone needs to watch that. It's a fucking riot. So that's my that's my two for on the goods. So but, yeah, and just another uh, uh, sort of adding to the chorus of how good I think that Arrow streaming service has gotten. Yeah. It's, it's got a lot of weird, great stuff. And... They properly curate. That's yeah. the difference. Like I think Shudder is classed as a curation service, and it was, I think, at start now. I think it's as new emphasis or is, you know, bringing movies in, not necessarily curating themes. I know they try and do it, but they don't do it necessarily all that well. Um, and, you know, getting all those exclusives, which they do. They get a ton of fucking great exclusives, um, of which I've seen a fair few now uh, in the last month and a bit. And some of them have been really good and some of them have been shit, but you kind of take your chances with that. Arrow, on the other hand, like, it seems month on month, they're actually, this coming month, I think September, um, they are going full in with um, kind of Asian cinema. Like, they're doing a full creative thing like that. I want to say there's a ton of Kurosawa on it. So, so they must have done a deal with like Criterion. So they're going out to other labels and organizing things to play on there, and they tailor them specifically for that theme month wise. So as a result, if you are a bit of a, cine a cinephile or you want to rend out your knowledge, it's the perfect fucking channel, and it's surprisingly cheap. Yeah, it's four or five bucks or something like yeah, that. A yeah, a month, which is about on par with Shudder. And yeah. I wouldn't say, like, d please don't cancel your Shudder subscription because they're also doing the Lord's work uh, just in a different way. That Argento movie is about to go on Shudder, so um, it goes on October and I can't fucking wait. But, yeah. I watched, so, uh, speak of the Arrow channel, I watched the, the Burning Moon recently, which was streaming oh, on wow. there. And I was like... I have th this movie is absolutely bonkers. Like it's hard yep. to it's hard to evaluate it as a movie because it's barely a movie. But it, yeah. it's super interesting in one of those films that I never would have watched unless it was on air. It was on there, know. yeah. Um, but speaking of Shutter exclusives, let me get to uh -oh. my bad, Duncan. Because uh -oh. I watched Spider One's Allegoria. And... I don't even know this. Okay, so, so... oh no, right. So Spider One as in Spider One as in yeah. like Paramount Five Thousand. Yeah. All right, right. So he's he's went the way as of his in brother. Rob, yeah, Rob Zombie's brother, yeah. uh, decided he was gonna do a horror anthology. Uh, see, that's the bit right there. See, that's the bit that instantly turns me off as soon as someone's like, that. "You know what I'm going to do for my first movie, an anthology." Yeah. And I'm like, maybe we just maybe we just crack being able to do a short first before we decide to do four shorts or hey, five yeah. shorts. So it. <laughs> And and it's also an anthology based around a theme. It's not right. just random stories. The whole idea of the of the movie, hence the the name Allegoria, is it's sort of an allegory of the creative impulse and the crea the the artistic life to some degree. And He's in a band called Paramount Five Thousand, Bo. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> And it is closer to the work of Glenn Danzig than it is Rob Zombie. Oh shit! It, now you're selling it to me. You should not no, be no, selling no. this. To but me. it's not. It's not nearly as like campy fun as that. Oh, it's dear. just wildly inept. Oh dear! And it's terrible. It and the way I've described it to people is, it's like a dumb person's idea of what a smart movie would sound like. Oh, uh, right. Where it's a lot of people like just uh, sort of, you know, expositing about the artistic impulse. And there's one of the segments is this guy that is an artist, like a, a, a you know, canvas, a paint on canvas artist. And uh, is on the phone with his agent about how he doesn't want to do corporate graphic design because he's an artist man. Uh, fuck this. And you may be surprised to learn, Duncan, that the horrible thing that he's painting kind of comes to life. Um, it's that kind of stuff where it's the most obvious stuff in the world. Yeah. And yeah. oh, let me here, uh, let me give you the opening bit and you tell me how you think it might end. So it is a drama teacher or drama coach. Yep. Saying that everybody has a, has a beast inside them. 
And he wants to see everyone's inner monster. So he pulls a woman on stage and berates and abuses her, telling her she cannot get, she cannot reach that place inside her where he can see, you know, the true beast inside. Can you guess how that might end? Does she end up having a beast inside? Book? It, yeah, Duncan. It's almost is like she you like saw a it. werewolf, or is she like a hey, vampire, kind or of is a she like demon thing? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. And does she does she reveal herself to him? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. he maybe shouldn't have wished to see that then, but probably shouldn't have. And it's just filled with <laughs> that kind of stuff where you're like, I can't believe that anyone thought like they were doing anything interesting or original. And yeah. everybody, when they start talking about art in the movie comes across as the it, it's again it it feels like a high school uh student wrote this but as rob zombie's brother so they will right. make money on that you know what i mean that's that's yeah. that's that you don't make money off the content you make the, money off the the name association so right. if spider one had not been the person making this movie it never would have been made or yeah. even if it had been made it certainly would not have been a shutter exclusive, but no. I'm sure that they thought, and it, look, I was a victim of it. Like, Hey, we can get eyes on this thing. If, yeah. if we say, Hey, spider one directed this horror anthology all about artists. Yeah. And, and then I watched it. And by the time it was done, I hated myself for having made that decision to watch it. <laughs> And I hated myself for finishing it. That's that's your that's your anthology story, Bo. Uh, you're aware of that. <laughs> if you were in a, if you were in the movie, your your anthology story would be so desperately wanting to see the movie that made you upset. So right, right, like if just every time <laughs> I turned on the TV, it would just be playing Allegoria. <laughs> that would be the hell that I created for myself. It, dude, it it's so bad and. You know, I really like a lot of the stuff that Shudder's been doing. I thought Glorious was all right. Glorious is a ton of fun. Like, Glorious hangs together a hundred times better than I thought it was gonna. It's it's fine. Um, oh, such a niece here. You I, look, I, I, I liked it. But then I like I saw it before I read everybody like losing their mind about it. Oh no, yeah. And, yeah. and then I was like, I don't see like it's a good two hander in terms of yeah, just being I, a, I, a yeah. very simple one location kind of place. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a in, interesting take on a kind of a Lovecraftian story in a way which I found surprise. Like I, I didn't like. Um, the, the the previous McHenry movie, I thought the one she did was All the Creatures Are Stirring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Christmas movie, I found that one painfully beige. And yeah. at least this one, I kind of got an idea of what her personality is like. Um, having listened to her obviously do a podcast for years, this is the one that sounded like sounded and felt more like her. And then the like the, the 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 most genius is up there as one of the most genius bits of casting this year is getting JK's Oscar winning JK Simmons to be a glory hole. Lovecraftian demon. Um, I kind of thought yeah. that was kind of like a it was a chef's kiss moment. I wish so. the conversations between them had been a little more interesting and a little more esoteric. Well, when you see, like, when you see, well, the the reveal is ultimately why you don't get that. Yeah, but yeah. sure. But, but yeah, I'm yeah. way way on that. I'm way on that one. Yeah, it's not it like it ain't making my end of your list, right? Yeah, yeah, imagination. Yeah. But I like, like I see, like when I read the synopsis of that originally. I was like, oh, that sounds like a movie I don't want to see. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I thought it, yeah. And again, I don't want to badmouth it or anything. I, I thought it was good. I, yeah. I just didn't, I didn't lose my shit over it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, what, so what is your bad movie? Literally just finished it just before we started. Um, so I'm going to be doing a review of it tonight. So if anyone is interested in my fuller thoughts on this, then you can check out podcast on the stairs, but I've just finished watching this number 72. And, uh, 88 films Italian collection series. Oh, the clip. Hitcher. Yeah, clip Hitcher in the Dark. Um, this is a, a movie I'd never heard of before. This is a later day on Berto Lenzi. It's 1989. Um, and it is fucking terrible. Um, so it's about uh, like a very rich, spoiled kid who's driving around in a kind of motorized home um, in Winnebago. And he is uh, he is picking up women and murdering them, right? I know, I know. But he is uh, he's 
obsessed with his mother that left him when he was a kid, when he was 10. So he is kidnapping girls who roughly resemble his mother, trying to then turn them into his mother so he can fuck them before killing them. Very Freudian. Uh, yeah, 100% Freudian. It's about as, like, although I don't know if I'm better lensing you that when he was making it. Um, <laughs> I think, right. I think, I think he, he thought it was Freudian because uh, I get the feeling that there was money put through this that was funneled somewhere like the mafia or some shit. Right. The London exercise. The dialogue is fucking awful. Like, this is a movie shot in English as well. So, this is a fucking awful dialogue. Just really, just absolutely horrific. Um, it is played with overacting, um, like the clip that I sent you, which is basically the, the boyfriend of the girl. It's worth saying as well the boyfriend that's trying to get the girl back uh, is cheating on her, which is why she leaves at the beginning of the movie. But then all of a sudden he becomes in the kind of knight in shining armor to like try and track down this this motorized home. Um and he, he he just like his way of investigating is he will just literally drive to places to find like a motorhome and then break into them to see if she's in there. Of uh, what she he duly does um on on a, a black man. Uh, who then has a hilarious fight because it's absolutely terrible, and they obviously don't know how to write for for like African American characters, so it's just every second word the guy says is motherfucker. Um, like he's Samuel L. Jackson uh, before Samuel L. Jackson was Samuel L. Jackson. Um, and yeah, it's terrible. The ending is absolutely awful as well, and never really. And then in the middle of the movie, wait, t-shirt contest. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, full on nips, like the boobs are out. Um, I'm like, I'm like, for... I like that. Like, it, it's sort of the uh, uh, crap. The bloodshed going to the rodeo, but instead, it, it's going to a wet t-shirt well, contest. He's, tra he's trying. He's trying to find his girlfriend. So the way he does it in the middle of it is he goes to another beach. He assumes that the guy's picking her up at beach resorts, like picking up more women. So he he's going to all these different like like campsites and all the rest uh, to try and find this this like motorized home. So he arrives at one and then spends. An awful long time at a wet t-shirt contest, uh, along with the audience and the viewers. Um, so yeah, it's as he as he, but once again, like I don't even know if this is one of these ones. Like Umberto Lindsay directs the shit out of this, as he does with everything. He's got the classic like like camera zoom ups and like all the stuff that you want. And technically, it's a very well made movie. It's just the story, the acting, and everything else is fucking rotten. Um, so yeah. Hitcher in the dark, uh, not very good. Um, please don't try and watch it unless you are like intentionally wanting to see a movie which, like, I was going to say, breaks all the rules. Um, makes you scratch your head as to like how anyone involved with the project. And the thing is, like, the actual central character is the killer. Plays that part really well. Like all the way through it, I'm like, right, you are just like a a nervous, like weird, like rapey. Dude, <laughs> like, I don't know if that's who you are in real life, but you're playing that part very well. Yeah. Um. So yeah, not not a good movie at all. So I, I, that's sadly, uh, I think it's the first one in a while that I've watched, which was just absolutely kind of terrible. The one that was before that, though, Bo, uh, was a movie starring Telly Savalas and uh, Chuck Bronson. What was that? Violent City. Oh, I've never, seen never that. heard of it before. That is an Italian finance movie. Chuck Bronson is an assassin. It's a hitman uh, who gets set up by this like international group of criminals um, who he's working for, right? But he gets set up by them because he won't go on the payroll properly. He's still like an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. um, so he goes away, does some time in prison, comes out, joins the organization only to find out that he's been played all along. Uh, and Terry Savalas is the, he's the, like, kingpin guy. And it is all shades of what the fuck are we doing here? <laughs> like, it's just, like, a, it's such a strange... It requires a few scenes of uh, Bronson to emote. Um, oh, that's... You don't want to rely on that. He can do it. Yeah, and he's at least he's not quite trying to squeeze a tear out, but he's not moving any muscle in his face at all. Sure. <laughs> like, just, Man, all right, speaking of Italian movies, though, this is yep. uh, neither on my good or bad, but just since we're talking about kind of Lindsay and Italian cinema, Ooh, yeah. um, you know, I am not necessarily the most fluent in, uh, in Giallo films. Yes. 
But uh, I saw one recently I really loved, Ooh. which was Sergio Martino's uh, The Strain. Uh, was it the? Hold on, let me get the. The Strange Vice of, of Mrs. Ward. Mrs. Ward, yeah. yeah. It's a fucking great movie. It's terrific. I had so much yeah. fun with that. It's so Martino, like... like Martino did, I think he did five Jowls. Um he maybe did a sixth one, but the sixth one was done well into the eighties, so it doesn't technically count. It's more slashery than it is like a like a Jallo, but he did like five Jallos in the in the period of about five years, four years, maybe even less than that, actually. Um and all of them are fucking great. Like, all of them are legitimately great. They're not, like, top-tier Jallo. They're not, like, Bird with the Crystal Plumage or anything mm -hmm. like that. But Martino is a ridiculously good director. And they're all different feeling. Like, you will at least... you will have, Everyone's seen Torso. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the Torso, I, I think, might have been his last one. Yeah. So that's the one where he's, like, he's like kind of like, I'm done with this, and that's why it's kind of half Jallo, half Slasher. But, like, the stuff before that is all, like, fucking great. So... I think I'm going to round out my Martino list because I've seen now Case of the Scorpion's Tail, Torso, and Strange Vice yeah. of Mrs. Ward. Yeah, so, so I... Case of the Scorpion's Tail was the one that he did in the 80s. So that's like later day Martino. But like you've got all the ones before that. So um... there's uh, All the Colors of the Dark and your. Which vice. is trippy as balls. It's like it's like a big psychedelic fucking gothic nonsense movie. You'll have a ball with it. And then your vice is a locked room and only I have the key. It's which the best name ever. Yeah. Right. And but which is kind of a line from the the strange vice of Mrs. Ward. Yes. Those two are usually I think he made them back to back. So. Yeah. So I'm I'm very curious to kind of round that it's out. It's excellent it as was, well. Dude. dude, I yeah, I had so much fun with it because it, it it's got everything I love about Giallo films, even though I'm not again as well versed uh, as you are certainly yeah. uh RGH. Uh, no, he is, RGS, he is the master. Rather, Richard yeah. Lynch Mitt. Um, that because, yeah, he knows everything about that stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so, you know, every now and again, I'll dip my toe back into those waters. And that was one of the better that I've ever seen. I think yeah. I just, it was, you know, it's very silly as all those movies are. The plot's just incredibly convoluted. Yeah. When you get to the end of the movie and like they reveal who the, be you know, sort of the uh, schemers of the movie are, you're like, so why were they doing this again? Yeah, yeah, it's, all... it's absolutely, it's utter nonsense. He, yeah. Like he went, he um, so he has got like a super interesting career as well because he's another one of those kind of work horse directors. So he's got that group of Jalo movies, and then he started transitioning over to doing the police Ateshi movies, which are basically police procedurals. That's what became popular right after Jalo. Jalo kind of morphed into that. They took yeah. away the kind of black glove killer and made it more about you know. Like, like crime and cops and investigation and then in the very early 80s he then started doing sci-fi movies and his sci-fi movies are fucking bonkers so um, he's like is he the one that did uh, the one that's kind of like a rip off of uh, Escape from New York but it's got like mutant aliens in it oh like um, the exterminators of the year like 20... yeah but he didn't do that I, I need to find out now um but he does uh, he did one that I watched which was also in the the 88 films uh, Italian collection, and it's. Um, I remember going like that. I can't believe this Jallo director's doing this. And then I watched it. I was like, "This is so fucking bonkers." Um, so he did. I'll give you a couple right here. That, is it like, Hands of Steel? Hands of Steel is one of them. And then 2012 or 2019 after the fall of New York. That's the one. So 2019 after the fall of New York is fucking bonkers, right? Hands of Steel, though, dude. Hans of Steel has got like you written or like that is a that is a maybe a one day future pick six movies based around a the theme. It's um it's it's kinda it's kinda bonkers, man. It really, really is. Um it's also in the 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 88 films um <laughs> Italian collections. Kinda kinda the the story behind it is he was supposed to I if memory serves you it's got George Eastman in it as well, mm -hmm. uh, big uh, big George Eastman. But I think in memory serves, he's supposed to. I think they were supposed to do a kind of. Oh, this is Rambo. like a Terminator ripoff, right? Yeah, well, uh, but it's like a Rambo ripoff as well. So it's like like it's like Rambo and Terminator merged into one, and it's absolutely fucking bonkers. Um, because this is the like the eighties are the heyday of. What's what's big in America just now? Well, these are the three biggest grossing movies of the last year, right? Let's just combine them, regardless what the genre is, into one movie. 
Like so, there you go. Um, it's a ton of fun. Uh, you like um, you've also I think you've got a bit of over the top in it. If memory serves, there's arm wrestling in it. So, um, so it's just so got it does sound right. wonderful. Yeah, you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it. So, um, there you go. There's a there a future pick six. Uh, could be um, Italian ripoffs I, of American classics. So. Let me let me tell you a little behind the scenes secret of Pick Six movies. Yeah, every now and again, I will nominate a film like that, yep. and Chad's going to be like, "I've never heard of that. We're not going to do it." Uh. <laughs> you know, he's very like he's very mainstream <laughs> Hollywood for the most part, and yeah, so when I'm not, like, "Yeah, yeah, well, hey, what about this weird, you know, uh, either Italian film or like, hey, here's l- let's do." Uh, some bizarre like South American zombie movie or something. He's just like, I've never heard of that. We're not going to. Well, well, let, let me just put it this way: I luckily have a show called Chronicle, which does exclusively European cinema. Yeah, and one day you could just pick one of them and come on. And I, it. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. the The other alternative is just like I just get Richard to come on Dark Parade to talk about one of those movies, which would be yeah. fun. You, you, you could totally nail that. Yeah. Um, it'd be a ton of fun and he'll know a lot more about them than I do yeah, but yeah I, oh man I love like I just sit at his feet when he starts talking about Italian films yeah yeah like you really like that's the thing like there's, there's so many threads and decisions and conversations and the movies are all weirdly linked yeah like in a way where it's all like oh yeah who worked on this movie who would then a year later work on Suspiria and then you're like how the fuck did we get from here to Suspiria and he's like well that that's because he's married to this guy um who was you know like brother with Argento who then like they're all there is it is, it is like on it is the mafia mm-hmm. um and in, in the best possible way so yeah um that's, that's kind of cool to know I, I always get excited when you tell me you've watched a jalo that you've really liked mm-hmm. because um, it makes me feel good. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm here for, Doug, is to make you feel good. But uh, also Ooh. to make you feel terrible, let's start talking about Inspector Clouseau yeah, from, from 1968. Um, so we, we talked about this a little bit last time, but just to give a little bit of backstory yes. on how this movie came to be. So the the studio, like Blake Edwards and Peter Sellers very famously had a falling out during the making of A Shot in the Dark. Because yes. they're just two very stubborn, headstrong, creative types and and butted heads. And like it doesn't sound like making the Pink Panther movies were great because they were constantly at odds. But that's yeah. also what produced, you know, like when you have two people who feel very strongly about something and, and it kind of heightens everybody's game to one degree or yeah, uh, so but in the interim, the studio was constantly trying to make a new one, and they keep essentially trying to approach. And Blake Edwards has no interest. And then we like four years later, um, after a shot in the dark, they're like, right, we're kind of we're this is what we want to do, mm-hmm. and here is the story that we have. Do you want to come back on board? And at that point, Blake Edwards, a, a, a say Harry Manfredini, the guy who does the score to the Pink Panther movies, which is why the score in this is utter dog shit. And oh, um, he didn't show up. Um, and Peter Sellers all were doing another movie in the same year, right? So yeah. they did a movie called The Party, which came out in the same year, which was a huge success. And the studio was like that. You know what? We don't need you, Blake Edwards. To well, direct. We don't need you, Peter Sellers, as Clouseau, and we don't need you, um, Harry Manfredini, to do the score. We can do it ourselves. Like we, like we, we can put a new director in there. Mm-hmm. We can put a new Clouseau in there, and very much like James Bond, we can just change these characters, and people will just roll with it. Right. What matters and is the character, not the actor. A hundred percent. And what I think they found it very quickly after this movie colossally fucking bombed is no, you can't. I think with other genres, maybe you can, but not in comedy. Uh, comedy, I think more than anything else, especially when you have a character. And it's worth saying Alan Arkin is not bad in this movie. Yeah, he's he he's playing, certainly trying, yeah. He has played the hand he is dealt as the hand he is dealt as he incredibly unfunny um script. And an incredibly unfunny series of set pieces. Well, and he is trying his hardest. My understanding, at least based on the the reading that I did, yeah, was that at one point Peter Sellers was going to come back and do this, mm. but he insisted on final edit of the script. 
Which wouldn't surprise me because he got more involved with that as the series went on. Yeah, and so, uh, but to your point, though, uh, the studio was like, we don't need you. Like, we've got Alan Arkin, who was coming off of a movie called The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, mm -hmm. which was a big hit. And mm -hmm. he became, he, like, was becoming a big comedic star yeah. on the back of that. So you've got your up-and-coming Alan Arkin, who is a tremendously yep. funny guy, mm -hmm. um, with you know, this director, Bud York, and, and the writer Who was, like, very close friends with him. And, but, like, if you if you go and you check, but uh, if you get a chance to check to see, like, Bud York and just in general, um, is a guy who, like, was active as a director for, like, a, a quite a bit of time, but then switched over to being a producer, and then you look at his producer credits, and that's, you know, he's he's got fucking shitloads of producer credits. Worked yeah. on both Blade Runner movies. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. He was he was a producer of the Blade Runner film, so like no slouch. You know, um, what I mean, both of them like came out of what I imagine was retirement to become a producer because obviously he was a producer in the first one. But like the guy has clout, so he brought in. A, he's apparently very friendly with um, Alan Arkin, so that's why that kind of worked. So you get a, like they at least tried to get a director and comedian pairing yeah. where they liked each other, which is the right step to do. It's just just do it on a different movie, which is essentially what Blake Edwards did. He's like that. Yeah. Like, Peter Sellers is really fucking funny. I want to make another movie with him again. Um, that Cluso stuff doesn't sound like it's going anywhere. Uh, so let's just do another comedy project. Which, by the way, The Party has not aged well. Um, the Party is basically the prototype of the guru because Peter Sellers plays an Indian character in it, full on with racist accent, so it has not it has not aged well at all. So, but it was a huge smash at the time. So ultimately, you end up with the the Pink Panther franchise being once again, and he's and it will happen a few times a state limbo because the studio has egg on its face because this is a colossal failure, and then the two guys on the other side kind of being like, well, yeah, we made the right choice here. Like we like, oh, I'd like this might backfire on us because we want to do this other project when there's guaranteed money and all the rest on this side for the the Pink Panther stuff. But we're going to stick to our guns here and we're going to see how this plays out. And they walked away, essentially quids in, as they would say in the UK. Uh, whereas on the other side, the studio is then kind of left in limbo for another prolonged period of time before we'll see Cluso after this. So yeah, yeah I mean, they, right? Like like they gambled thinking, as you said. They could just put anybody in this role, and, and yep. it kind of killed the franchise for a while. Um, another yeah. interesting Alan thing... Arkin, like, I was going to say, I don't know if you have this quote, but Alan Arkin about this movie has said infamously that this movie humbled him um, mm. as an actor, because he, he felt fearless up until the point he did it, and then it humbled him. But what's interesting as well is almost every actor that's played the Clouseau character, um, either playing the part or turning it down, um, has sprung from this. Like, Dudley Moore was supposed to play Clouseau in the 80s, I believe, late 70s, early 80s, um, after Sellers died, and cited this movie as the exact reason he didn't want to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not touching that. <laughs> it's, it's, well, uh, that sounds like career suicide. Why would I want to do that? Yeah, yeah. And and again, you know, Alan Arkin is, is very funny. One, one quick yes. note about Bud Yorkin as well, um, speaking of his production stuff, he was uh, the executive producer of... Sanford and Son and All oh, in the wow. Family and yeah, What's yeah, Happening. Yeah. A bunch of Norman Lear shows. Mm -hmm. And you will see Norman Lear's name featured prominently in this movie in the graveyard yep. scene. Yes. Which yes, is yes, yes. one of the few moments in this movie where I was like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we want to say some nice things about this movie to get it out of the way. Because, like, there's really nothing in this movie that is worth. It is like a series of just the most... Like I I uh, I went back to do a little bit of research and there's a uh, a Roger Ebert review. I don't know if he actually wrote the review, but it's on their website, uh, which like painfully picks out there is he a, a a scene in this one where um Cluso I think says to it's like the guy who's in charge of Scotland Yard um that this isn't a time to laugh. Mm -hmm. This isn't a time to laugh. And what they basically said is never has truer words been spoken about a movie. Um, when, when that line came out, it was like, oh, man, you're just setting yourself up. For yeah, oh, what we're doing here. Like, at the end on the joke. Yeah. Um, 
I but a lot know. of the, a lot of the reviews at the time were like, "This movie is terrible." Alan Arkin is doing his best and has funny moments. He is he. You can tell in his face. He this is not a paycheck performance. Yeah. This of is a. Not. I'm going to take a swing at this because once again, you've got to imagine from a studio point of view, selling this to Alan Arkin is if this is successful. Right, he's Inspector Clouseau. Like they can make a million movies. Yeah, we can we can do a ton of these, and you're going to get paid a lot of money. And it's the Bond thing. This is like I think people forget that, like even like in the UK, and it's still to an extent. It's more to create controversy now when they mention that Bond might be a woman or Idris Elba that everyone gets their their kind of knickers in a twist. Mm -hmm. But for a while there, for the longest period of time, the passing of the baton between one Bond to the next Bond was a big fucking deal. Mm -hmm. It was a huge deal. Who is going to be the next Bond? Um, and I like, I like in my lifetime, I distinctly remember the buzz about Timothy Dalton getting it and the buzz about um, fucking Australian dude uh, whose name's on the tip of my tongue, Goldeneye. Pierce Brosnan. Uh, when Pierce Brosnan got it as well, the same kind of, this has been, uh, and then when Daniel Craig was announced, like, like, like I, I don't think there was a, a, a dry pair of pants in the house because uh, everyone just got super excited about that. But that was the that was the thing. So, like, the idea of even a studio going, we could do something like this, to me, is an interesting concept. But, <laughs> but it requires a really funny script, and that's where this, like, the humor's just all wrong. Like everything, like they try and do it at weird times. There's no real set. Like we joked about the the thing about the previous movie, I shot in the dark, is like once you understand what the gag is, when it's repeated the next time, like the paddy wagon scene, like the fact he's never got a license, when it comes in again, it's stupid, but it's funnier. Like every time that happens, it gets funnier and funnier because you can see, you can see the setup of the joke. And you know what the punchline is. You're just waiting to find out what mechanism is going to trigger the punchline. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the bit. In this, there's a running gag here that Clouseau is a bit of a control freak. So he likes to move the furniture around or likes to move around to weirdly assert some sort of do dominance or keep people like all that. And none of those jokes work. Like at all. At any point in the movie. And they keep doing it. In fact, in one scene, they use the same gag about 10 times in a five minute scene and none of them are funny yeah and i'm like at what point were we still put what at what point are we still doing this in this scene like were people like genuinely laughing when they were filming this because we're going to keep coming back to this gag and not funny um and by the 10th time guess what not funny so it's that sort of stuff where i'm just like super confused at at what point anyone thought they were doing anything that was going to be Huge. Maybe it's that thing where you're so close to the coal face that you can't see it. But I don't know, man. It just feels, it just feels totally off. Yeah. From the start, you yeah. The and opening scene, the opening gag is just it's off to the side and not quite right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So it start the before we get to Clouseau himself. It starts off with in in London, yeah. where there's a the head of Scot Scotland Yard, Sir Charles Braithwaite. Yeah. Uh, as so not by. not Sir, not Sir Charles Dreyfus, Sir Charles yeah. Braithwaite, right? So like, it's different, Bo. It's different. There, there, the yeah. so different. There's no Dreyfus. There's no Cato. No. It is. It. Is, we're, we're in London for no reason at all. Right. Except we can use a lot of British actors. I, yeah. I don't know, but like, that didn't stop us doing. But I don't know. Let's take him so, on the road. That'll work. Yeah. Right. If we put him somewhere other than you know. Paris or Italy or uh, wherever, then maybe people will forget that it's a different guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the 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 setup is that there has been a big train robbery. Uh, the great train robbery, great which train is robbery. an which is actually a thing. So they're basing this on the back of the great train robbery in the yeah. UK, which I think at the time was the. It was that the largest amount of money stolen. Yeah, it's a oh, it's a fascinating me. story too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a uh, anyway. If, if you haven't looked into it, you can actually check out um, what episode there was a pick six movies where the the introduction is all about the Great Train Robbery. Oh and, wow! And I, I can't remember 
what episode we did that for. Um, but at any rate, uh, if you like train stories, look that up. You should be uh, listening to both show anyway, so you they'll all be shouting the, the episode. You, right, yeah. Listening. Some that that's the thing. You know how it goes. Like somebody will tell you, like, oh, it was this episode, dummy. It's like I've done. Yeah hundreds of podcast yeah, like, episodes yeah like since that time i've recorded a thousand hours yeah um, uh, yes. but, but yeah so and but the notion is that that was a setup for bigger scores yes. and so uh the prime minister has essentially decided to call in some help uh, to yeah, there's a vote case. of no confidence in sir charles so he is he's reached out to a crack detective from somewhere else to help and of course the Surte has sent Inspector Clouseau. Yeah. Once again, just reaffirming that the French hate the English. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, the War of the Roses was only the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and this is where we first meet Alan Arkin, who comes, steps off the plane in the pouring rain, and we discover, surprise, surprise, Duncan, he's not wearing shoes. He gets to the, he gets out of the plane, walks all the way down the stairs in the rain gets to the bottom of the stairs, then looks down and discovers that his feet are wet and he's not wearing his shoes. Yeah. <sighs> right. And so he tries <laughs> to call up to, to ask for his shoes, but it's too loud or something. And because you don't hear any dialogue because the, the really annoying music it has to play. Yeah. Also, I think they're holding back on the accent at this point because they want that to be a reveal. I, I think guess. that might be the idea, but it's fucking stupid. Uh, uh, it's yeah so he he's trying to get back on the plane but he can't like the the people coming off of the plane push him back down the stairs so he goes to the other set other of, door. Yeah, yeah the other door on the plane goes up those stairs hands the woman uh the the flight attendant his umbrella yep goes to get his shoes gets his which shoes. is now being held by the other lady at the other door so right. he walks through the plane to get his shoes, puts his bag down, puts on the shoes, gets ready to walk out that door. But guess what, Bo? He forgot, he forgot his, his bag. Umbrella. Well, he well, almost forgot his to... umbrella first. So he's like, oh. So then he looks across, sees the woman's got his umbrella. So he's like, I had to go that way. So he starts to walk, forgets his bag, Bo. So then I still have his bag. And then he walks to get his umbrella. And now he's got his umbrella. He's got his bag and he's wearing his shoes. Yeah. And unfortunately, though, during that time, the stairs have been pulled away. So he steps off of the plane, falls onto a uh, baggage uh, tram that is leading him away. And it, Duncan and Bo both cracked ribs laughing. It, that's the thing. It's such a bummer because it's like, oh, I see where this is headed. And, it, and I don't like it. And it's also the... I mean, we've had this gag before. Like, the Clouseau ends up soaking wet was how we started off a shot in the dark. Right, but it's... But it's so you know much I mean? quicker. It's just him falling into the... It's, he falls into it, he yeah. walks into the room, his introduction to the character is him shaking a hand and he is soaking wet. Right, and that but, is funny. Right. Like, the, so... the joke isn't, oh, he got wet and he he's stupid. It's that he is he he is playing off that he hasn't yes. committed He's playing this. it straight. Right. Yeah. And like having this protracted gag, and we'll see it because in the very next scene is the one we were talking about with uh, him moving around because it's him meeting Sir Charles Braithwaite. Yeah, so he goes, he goes, the so he goes through baggage claim and oh, he meets right, the right, two right. guys from Scotland Yard. This is like a non joke as well. So he meets the two guys from Scotland Yard and they're like, Inspector Clouseau, great to meet you. And he's like, nah, 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 you don't mention my name, I'm undercover. And they're like, yeah, but like, we, what we're going to do is like, there's a diplomatic pass here that we can like rush you through so you don't have to go through customs. He's like, no, 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 I'm a secret agent. I am just a tourist from France. Um, so like you have to treat me like everyone else. So he basically goes up to passport control, and as he's handing his, as he's trying to find his passport, he pulls in his pocket, and comically, a set of brass knuckles, a gun, and two grenades fall out. Right. Which why on earth would Cluso have all of this stuff on him? But whatever. So uh, he's arrested, uh, right. and then in the next scene, he is meeting. But you Sir haven't Charles. seen my passport. Yeah, and this is he's, he's getting dragged away, and I'm like. Oh my god, that joke's worse than the previous one. Yeah. Like, I'm, I like, I don't know about you, they, uh, but I was kind of pining for the 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 shoes being missing <laughs> at that point. I was like, <laughs> maybe it wasn't all that bad after all. Uh, so then we go to the meeting with Charles Braithwaite, where he is telling uh, Clouseau, like, here here's what's going on. We found these three, uh, 
three of the thieves that were in on this yes. train robbery, one of whom is in prison, and the other two are on the loose. Yeah, well, one, the one that's in prison, though, we're going to get to this in a second as well, because no one seems to be upset that this guy escapes and Clouseau's behind it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's never mentioned. The re- it's the reverse of the him constantly letting Elkie Summers go yeah. and shot in the dark, which is a, a fun running gag because of just the insanity of, you know, well, of course she is innocent <laughs> because it, she is, she looks too guilty to have done it, you know? Yeah. And, and then, but then, like what you, what you get here in this scene, right? Like, so what you get in this scene with Sir Charles is, this is the, the gag that I'm talking about. So when he sits down opposite on his desk and there's like a picture which Clouseau moves so we can talk to him better. Right. And, and then during the conversation, he moves seats to the other seat and there's two pictures there. So he moves those two pictures apart. And at that point, I was like, all right, is this like an OCD thing or something? Um, but then in the space of it, and this scene goes on painfully long, like painfully long. Remember the other, remember the, the Dreyfus scenes where they're just quick snap. You yeah. did what? Ninkampo. You know what I mean? Like we get those quick, like we just react. All we need is a reaction, Bo. Um, but in this one, there's a lot of kind of setting the stage for like Sir Charles thinks there's someone on the inside and he shouldn't trust anyone. And Clouseau's like, well, maybe I shouldn't trust you. And he's like, well, maybe you shouldn't trust me. Um, but as they're doing this, Clouseau keeps sitting in a different chair and he always does it after Sir Charles stands up to move around to talk to him. Sorry if I hit my mic. Uh, to, to move around to talk to him. He then sit on, and then he's not there anymore. And it's once again, it's playing off the gag from the previous movie of him like rehearsing his speech mm-hmm. and then going out the room and coming in and not realising that she's in the room with him. So it's like, it's almost as if the writers have been like, well, that was funny. Let's extend that out. Right. Without yeah. realising what made it funny, which is the shortness of it. Uh, well, you know what they say, uh, stretching out a joke is the soul of wit. <laughs> um, but I'll, you know we, the moment this all right, never heard that before yeah, well, <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the movie where this gag is done better is Caddyshack 100% where, and it, it's the scene where uh, uh, Danny goes to talk to Judge Smales in his office yeah. and they keep looking around the lamp until yes. Ted Knight just shoves everything off of his desk like that's yes. a it, it's a very quick gag. There's not a lot of attention drawn to it until you have the punchline. And there's a great payoff. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's like, but this is just it's like it becomes more elaborate. But the the building of the elaborateness of the setup has to be predicated on something that is funny to begin with. Yeah, and it, it and it's, it's not. Yeah, it's not as a tedious thing. But basically. Um, we find that Sir Charles is not happy that they've sent Clouseau. Um, he sees it personally as a smite against him. Um, and Clouseau is going to work with Special Branch. Now, this is the Bond thing that I mentioned before. So we basically get a scene with Clouseau sitting down with uh, Weaver, um, who's played by Frank Finley. And Weaver is basically, the he's, he's, he's in cute. charge of... the. Yeah, he's the, but he's also in charge of the investigation. So this is Q. If Q was in charge, if Q was an actual to goodness secret agent, yeah, like out in the field. So this guy which, is investigating, but it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's not the Clouseau character. He's not a secret agent. He's no. a detective. But he's getting all these Bond like devices. Yeah. He gets a lighter, which uh, basically has a laser in it. He gets uh, a box of matches, which, where the match- matches actually create like smoke for smoke signals. It's like, yeah, it's like a flare, a signal, yep. a, a smoke signal box of matches. Yeah. Yep. He gets uh, a, a like a, a cigarette holder, which is actually a tape recorder device thing which is malfunctioning even at the start which we know that'll play into a gag later on Bo. oh multiple um, gags duncan yeah they, they can't get enough of this gag it, it um, kind of ends the movie in a way so anyway yeah as you get that um we see uh uh like a like a vest that when it gets wet it puffs up to become like a, a, a life vest mm-hmm. um so we we get that um I'm sure there are other gadgets, but basically, as soon as I see all these, instantly I'm like, right, there's going to be a joke based around everything that we've just been shown here. So we're future setting up jokes. Hopefully they'll be funny. Mm, yeah. It, it's <laughs> like this scene kind of ends with him accidentally 
setting off the laser and yes. and severing goes to light his pipe and, right yeah and he, he sets off a laser which severs the pipe creates a giant hole around the entire room shocks weaver yeah um like inflates the suit up and then weaver for some reason like they're both standing together in a weird scene uh where weaver ultimately yeah. invites him to dinner because he thinks he should meet his wife it makes sense later on when we find out, by the way, the re the reveal of the Weaver character is the worst reveal ever because, like, instantly I was like, right, you probably are in on this. You're probably the leak. Mm -hmm. uh, but he invites him home to meet his wife. Now, don't know if you know what country I'm from, Bo, but there's some stereotypes used in an upcoming scene that deeply offended me. Uh, like, I was fucking yeah. swearing like a bastard at the screen when this stuff was coming up. Oh man! All right, so it was written by an Englishman. I could fucking tell. I could tell. So, it, so he goes to the prison first, right? Is is that's the next scene? Is him going to interview? So, Steel? Yes. So, yeah. So he goes to interview Steele, who is a hairdresser at the prison. Right? Question mark. Well, like one of the most dangerous bank robbers is just given access to scissors and open razor blades and all the rest because that's what you'd want to do. Um, and he's giving a haircut. To this guy who we will later find on uh, has like the worst criminal name ever but he's giving this haircut to this guy and we get the, the he's the warden's son he's the warden's son but yeah. we're getting this kind of thing where Cluso is like you take a time and he's like uh, i always take my time and he's like okay then and then Cluso comes across to see his hair and he's like what are you doing i told you to go over there and he's like, and then i said this and then they repeat the same conversation again that's not funny right i i was that was another moment of like, is this supposed to be a joke? Because I it think it is. It's not very good. It's not funny either. Yeah. But uh, the, the warden, the warden gets up, and basically reveals that he's Cluso. The warden's son, sorry, reveals he's Cluso, um, and kind of walks out the room. And as he's walk, like walking out the room, Cluso's like, I really wish I hadn't blown my cover. And then Cluso decides to get a haircut, even though his cover's been cracked. Mm -hmm. by a hardened criminal who has access to scissors and razor blades. Right, but who doesn't use any of those, but starts... like Chloroforming Clu him? Yeah, Cluso, there's a, kind of a joke where he's asking him about the robbery and what he might know, and, and this guy does mention Johnny Rainbow. Johnny Rainbow, which Cluso writes on his, his notepad really quickly, as if you'd have to remember the name Johnny Rainbow. Right. Like, as I, if I better it's write not... this down. This common name, like Joe Smith. I better write this one down here in case I forget it. And um, he hides his thing. Once again, why is he hiding his notepad? Because this guy knows he's a detective, but we're, we're not going to worry about that. He puts a, a hot towel on his face and then pours chloroform on it, putting him in sleep, and then sneaks out the prison question mark like uses never his, mentioned again yeah uses cluso's coat i think to kind of disguise yeah. himself but anyway. never mentioned though yeah never mentioned after this scene like at all even a little bit and i'm like well, so what we eh this is some fucking terrible like writing absolutely terrible right yeah and <sighs> so then then we go to the dinner yes which is yeah. Which, which, when he opens the door, we we get an introduction to the uh, the female love interest. Lead. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the love interest in this movie, who is the quote unquote opier yeah. of the house, played um, by Delia Bocardo. Yeah, who is beautiful in this movie. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and she and very mysteriously, as soon as uh, she has a moment with Clouseau, tells him. Yeah. Oh, you know, we need to speak, and but not right now. We have to do it away from, yes, uh, away from uh, everyone. Yeah, and so he's like, "Oh, this is, <laughs> this is very good," <laughs> and <laughs> my Alan Arkin as Cluso. And so then, um, this well, it, 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 like Cluso, like who speaks to Weaver, and he's like, "That if that's your old pair, I can't wait to see your wife, you dirty dog." And here comes the joke that has to be your favorite of the movie. I fucking hate this. He's married to Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, yeah, it is a Scottish woman. In full Highland... No, sorry, no, no, no. She's not. like that's the, I, I'm playing into stereotypes here. She's dressed like how the world thinks people in Scotland dress, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how we don't. Um, it's like how, like, there's a whole swath... Billy Connolly does a great bit about this, about all these English people 
that move up to the Highlands when they're older and buy like like cottages and the stately homes and and, and kind of try and claim their Scottish heritage. Um and then doing so they all have the they all have like surnames as first names. Like Macintosh, if you you know like it's all this yeah. stuff. Oh, 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 you know, of, of, of course, Carmichael, I'll be there in a minute. You know, it's all this shit. But she comes down the stairs and it's not that she's Scottish. It's not that she is involved with the Highland Games that we're going to go to, an indoor Highland Games, which isn't a thing. They're all held outside because we're Scottish. And if you're going to do it, you will brave the weather like every fucking person else. Um, you don't do them inside. But, like, we're going to go to this, like, like feel-good Scottish thing in London, which is happening, which, once again, would never fucking happen. Mm -hmm. But but she comes downstairs and she's like, oh, look at you, wee laddie. Oh, dearie. Oh, look at you, laddie. Oh, I, I bet you just can't wait to go. And I, I was watching this going, I want to kill someone. It, it is so totally bad. Mrs. Dalfire. That is such she a great is, Oh, she's like, I could beep up, dance to you, drop and make a wicked cup of cocoa, you cheeky monkey. I'm like, what are we doing? And, but she's full on and she takes a shine, Clouseau, right away. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, totally wants to a, get down with him, yeah. Yeah, she wants to rape him, yeah. basically. She, like, so, like, there's no getting around there. Oh, dear. We're going to the the Scottish, the Scottish celebration here. Come along, dearie. And so, so like, like they literally drag him to this, right? Yeah. And it's like it's every like horrible stereotype that I hate here on the screen. It's, to yeah, be honest, if you go with logs, and... yeah, it's a, a, they toss the caber. Which if you go to Highland Games, they do toss the caber. They don't toss it like they do in here. That's like factually inaccurate but we'll we'll let them off yeah they just kind of run with it until it falls out of their hands yeah like, you're supposed yeah. you do you run with like the, the whole point without like trying to educate people out there is that in order to score points the caber needs to go over the top of itself and land down and you get points not for distance but how close it is to 12 o'clock so you basically want it to go over and be completely perpendicular to yourself um and that's the that's like but they're a lot bigger than what those guys are carrying they're basically yeah. trees right because in scotland that's 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 how manly. Unless you can carry a giant fucking tree and throw it, yeah. uh, you're you're not a man. Oh, you, you can it. carry it, but can you yeah. throw it? And then to act like once again, Scotland's all about that machismo thing. Uh -huh. Like, how do we make this more masculine? You have to wear a skirt to do it. Uh, like, it's all those things. You know, what I mean? set we're, it we're, on fire. <laughs> it's a, like. Flame caber is not a joke, right? Flame caber is a real thing, and it's going to come and get us all, right? <laughs> uh, so we'll play a game of flame caber. You're in trouble, boy. Uh, but uh, no, I, had, so I had a flame caber, but I got some of those medicated pads, and that I got, a, I got a cooling spray, yeah. um, and I took it, cleared yeah. it right up. Uh, but the <laughs> so yeah, so it's it's all it's the like traditional Scottish sword dancing. There's a like a procession of pipers there and all the rest. And Cluso's getting into it. He's like doing a bit of the Scottish dancing. He's drinking a little bit of the drink. He's dancing on tables. He eventually goes to like toss the caber, but like that's a like a, oh, a, a, oh there's a bunch of shenanigans there where he's still holding on to it. The guys are trying to help him, and he's like put me down, put me down. But meanwhile, there's assassins here. And one of the one of the group that are trying to get him is in here following her around. So we're gonna get that once again the scene from A Shot in the Dark, where there's gonna be numerous amounts of failed assassination attempts on Closo, which is a theme in the other movies. But when you see the other movies, you'll see done a hundred times better than this. So the, the deal is that the guy's about to shoot Closo. He's about to stab him at one point, but that doesn't happen. So he then goes to shoot Closo, but he's won the raffle. And yep. he's won this plum pudding, which becomes a character in this movie inexplicably. <laughs> like, yeah, a lot he's of talk obsessed about this. with this plum pudding. Yeah, and like the 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 payoff to this is fucking stupid. But anyway, he wins this plum pudding, and as he's kind of walking away to get the plum pudding, he you know like, he's so excited to get it that when he's <laughs> he drops a K bar, and when he drops a K bar, he's got this. That was the other the other gadget was a. a Gun belt. belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think not as sexy as from Dust Till Dawn. So it doesn't like pop it like a penis. Um, it's more just the clip opens and there's three shots in it. And so when he he's doing his stretchy thing to be all like happy that he's done something, he stretches up and his stomach muscles contract. They're setting off the gun and killing the assassin by accident. Boom. Yeah, and uh, accident. so accident. 
Uh, <laughs> so, but that is a problem because uh, uh, he gets the business from Weaver about yeah. like, hey, you killed our suspect, and so we yeah, can't, can't question, question him then. Yeah, right. and so I now need to go away and do all this paperwork. I'm going to leave you with my incredibly horny wife, right. who then takes him home and basically tries to ride him like sea biscuit. It's it's, <laughs> it's deeply worrying. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, but he's obsessed with this plum pudding, as we yeah. mentioned. Yes, and and uh, I think it's Lisa, the au pair, who tells him she has to go. Yeah, she, right. Like, she she has to go because there are other assassins. <laughs> Yes. And and he decides, well, they will try to come at me by what I love the most. What do I love the most? Food. It is food. Yeah. It is my yeah. plum pudding. Yes. So what we get, we get essentially like he has to in the in the interim, he's already visited Sir Charles at his gentleman's club. I fucking hate English people. Um, I don't. I don't really. I love you all. I love you all. I just there's a certain tier of English people, wealthy ones that I just fucking hate. Um, and they're on this gentleman's club, and he gives like Cluso a kind of quasi dressing down for like killing this guy, um, and not leaving any witnesses, uh, or anything that we can do for questioning. And um, he's trying to reach for his lighter. Like Cluso's basically being all like, "This is what yeah. I do," no. And he's reaching for his lighter, so Cluso takes out. The matches and strikes it and it sets off the flare thing and he's trying to put it out so he puts it out in this bottle of what I think is whiskey supposed to be which upsets Char Sir Charles because he's been nursing this bottle since Dunkirk. Um, oh, fuck this movie. You know, it, but I was thinking when the Dunkirk thing came up I was like, oh, I guess Dunkirk wasn't that 20 far years. I mean, it's yeah, it was 20, 20, 25 years yeah, before this movie. Not even that. Like maybe 20... 22, 23 years, so I can, it's, it's believable that he would have had a bottle of whiskey at his gentleman's club that he was only taking small nips out of every now and again, and it lasted him that long. Uh, but he's more upset that Cluso's ruined his whiskey than he is about anything else, and he's just yeah. like, well, And I was so to go. disinterested in what was going on in the movie. I could that... be, at this point, I'd already fully checked out, Bo. Like, yeah. I, like, at this point, I was just like, we are, we're, we have to go through the motions to do this, and this is going to be a long fucking movie. Right, but at uh, the very least, I could think about, like, oh, I guess Dunkirk was kind of within that generation. Yeah, you're like, you're off, you're off, like, you're just creating, like, links to <laughs> yeah. things that are more interesting. Uh, your, this is your brain protecting you, so your brain is, st <laughs> like, starting to build up, like, stories that are more interesting, so yeah. you don't flatline. Um, <laughs> totally, so that I didn't just pass out in the chair, it's like... <laughs> yeah, it's like, you, we is... need to watch this, Bo. <laughs> <laughs> this is like uh have, have you watched Barry? Uh, no, the, no, okay. no, 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 no. There there's a great gag on there where he's talking about how you get back at someone mm. and he says, Yeah, what I can do is I can break into her house and slowly replace all of her furniture and dishes with slightly smaller versions of all of those things <laughs> so that so that she'll think she's getting bigger and eventually she'll think she's going crazy and her brain start to eat itself. <laughs> and so and that's what I, that's what was happening. My brain was starting to defend itself from that. It was, yeah, it was like physically trying to defend itself. But basically <laughs> Cluso then that's when Cluso finds out that no, he's at breakfast. He's at breakfast with two other detectives that we've never met before. Mm -hmm. That are, and he's let's do the facts of the case. So we're doing another. Let's do the. Thing. So he's going through it all, and then he kind of hyperventilates in a like almost like some sort of weird loop of logic where he comes back to that they will get me through the thing that I like. They'll try and come at me a different way with the thing that I love, which is the things that I eat, which is my pudding, uh, my my plum cake. So he then, no explanation of this, shows up in full military gear from the Second World War, carrying the largest metal detector I've ever seen and a crack team of military bomb experts at the Gentleman's Club, which has been evacuated, to rush in to find these put in, and they're all like, it's not in there, and then he puts it in, like, a bucket of water for no mm -hmm. reason, pulls it out, uh, and they start... At first, it's like, I, I hear it is ticking. Yeah, and... well, he lifts it up to his ear and he watches beside yeah. his ear, and he's like, oh, it is ticking, no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Puts it in a bucket of water, but his hand goes into the water with the watch. So when he lifts it up, it's no longer ticking because his watch is... Which, once again, we don't need to... They actually explain this joke. Like, right after right, this. we saw it. I was like, there. 
yeah, yeah. and I'm like, what would like it wasn't whatever humor was in that joke is now completely gone. Um, but yeah, he starts raking through this pudding, he can't find anything, and they're all like, there's nothing in there, and he eventually finds a small little red pill, which they're like, ah, looks like a cyanide capsule, which is once again never explained. Yeah, I mean, the the explanation that they give is that it was just laying around. And so somebody must have poisoned it, question mark? Yeah. And and, like, and, right, so, but anyway, like, Cluso, like, breaks another few things in the room because he's so, he's so, like, all over the place. And so, yeah, like, we're back to, like, we're back to this position of, like, Cluso is trying to solve the case by driving out in this country road and he picks up a hitchhiker hmm? this fucking thing well yeah uh, because they find a matchbook for the tutor arms on the, the, the dead guy's arms. body yeah. yes and so he's gonna go investigate this but as you said he, he picks up a hitchhiker and who's a, a lovely lady all and this is one of i think two jokes that worked for me in the movie yep. which is she has her her uh the hood up mm -hmm. the boot um yeah. uh, That's uh the and uh he he's trying to fix her engine and he says oh yes it is uh this one if it is this place it will uh, fix your car and and he like touches it to you know another uh, this wire to another part of the car and you see a smoke and she goes oh that's great is it fixing he goes oh no it will <laughs> it is completely ruined now <laughs> yeah and it's a good delivery <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and a, and a pretty good joke. It's like I, so on the last per hour. I would say there is one because there was another one joke in this, later, yeah. and there's another joke at the end that I find funny. <laughs> so I laughed at that. I laughed twice. <laughs> I laughed. Yeah, I did. I laughed twice in this movie, and that's one of them. And so he offers to take her back to town, and and says that she's going to tutor arms. And he's like, "Well, what the coins it is? Uh, that is where I am going." And so, so her uncle owns the two arms, right. apparently. And he asks if he wants something to eat. And the joke being, Cluso says he's not hungry and then orders like a hundred things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd like kill me now. Um, and then they go upstairs to eat the food and she's being all sexy like. Oh, sure. And, and then like he goes to the, the bathroom to change out down into his robe uh, for some sexy loving. And when he comes back in, a different woman is there. Mm -hmm. And he's like, have I walked into the wrong room? So we get a kind of protracted, oh, is this the, I will go back in and I will open the door again and this different woman is here. Um, so we then get a scene of him being kind of caressed by her while she's feeding him food. And then she chloroforms him. Mm -hmm. And then the uncle, the original woman, and this woman in blonde, come in, put a face mask over him to essentially create a Cluso mask, which is part of this team's master plan. Um, shite plan. So the <laughs> plan shite is a, like, this is like, like, but it's an acronym, S-H-I-T-E, with the mm -hmm. dots. And I was, I, I'm not going to spell out what it means, but you can work it out if you think harder. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, send so it they, in to Duncan and Bo at DuncanandBo.com. And we will read them out in the air. Never. Yeah. Um, we, will, we will keep them to ourselves and say, I can't believe people fell for the thing that Duncan was using as exposition so he can remember what happens in the next scene. Um, <laughs> but it's come to me. This is what you do. You pad for time. Always pad for time, Bo. Yeah. Um, which is basically this movie. This movie is a giant padding of time. But the... So they've created the, the thing of his face. Uh, he comes out of it and thinks he's in a bullfight. I, which is... I guess... I, again, it's... I well, understand the uncle absurdity. hides under the bed. Yeah, right? the yeah, uncle yeah. hides under the bed, and he jump, starts jumping on the bed with the other two women, which then breaks, crushes the uncle to death, and he also has the tattoo of the criminal organization. So technically, Cluso has killed two assassins. That's right. Um, Although this guy wasn't trying to kill him, because then the Cluso mask would be redundant. Sure, and yeah, so it's uh, they find another Johnny Rainbow tattoo. And so then they're going. Rainbow <laughs> they're they're going to our, our Clouseau decides he is going to um, follow them to Frenchie's funeral. Yes, the 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 make the assumption that this guy's funeral they will all show up. Like all these criminals will show up to the death of a wanted criminal. Right. 
which they the, kind of do, which is which makes no sense, yeah. like at all. Yeah. But so they, he's they, they he's do. not wrong, and th- so at one point he's trying to uh, find some conveyance to the funeral and the warden's son happens to be there and tells him to take this motorcycle that's got a you know cart full of fish attached to it yes and so he takes that and then we learn that the owner of the fishery uh that is is like you know somebody stole my cart and uh so there is a bit of a chase where Clouseau is, you know, going through the streets of Paris is where they are at this point. I, I think. think so. I think so. And I'm assuming that the guy's called Frenchy, so we'll yeah. just assume, we'll assume Paris. But he's going through it. And meanwhile, there's a mishap with his fucking recording device, which starts recording all this police noise. Yeah, he, Right. It's emergency vehicles because he's stopping traffic and, and preventing an ambulance. And all this stuff, and he's trying to record a message to Weaver. Yes. But, you know, of course, screws it up because it's Clouseau. But he ends up getting um, getting to the funeral. Yeah. And he, and he's noticed because he's not dressed in black and also he's kind of bumbling around. Yeah, he falls into a grave. This uh-huh. scene is really fucking weird, by the way. Right, so he falls into a grave and then this kid comes over because his tape recorder starts playing noises. This kid comes over. Cluso tries to get the kid to help him out, pulls the kid into the grave, mm-hmm. right? Then basically stands the kid up, tells him to put his hands out in front of him, then uses him as a climbing tool to get out of the grave and then doesn't help the kid out. And yeah, once again, my question there. is, is this supposed to be funny? Question mark. It, it, right. I was like, this just seems like child abuse. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then the 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 recording device starts going off, playing all kinds of sirens and stuff. And yeah, naturally, which, yeah, every every criminal there then like starts chasing him. And then as he's running out, the fishmonger shows up and then he sees him running away. So then he starts chasing him with the police that were involved. And then we get this big chase sequence. And I'm like, what are we doing? Yeah. What are we doing? So you're right. So anyway, Lisa ends up saving the day and saving Clouseau. But he doesn't believe that she works for Interpol. Right. So, uh, so he arrests her by handcuffing himself to her through the steering wheel right and here's so, a joke that doesn't give you any time to even appreciate it yeah he puts he's trying to handcuff her and you can see her hands through so he puts the handcuff on her through the steering wheel and then literally next scene he's in the room with another police officer and her hand is there with the steering wheel on it yeah and i was like what the fuck and, like, and, but at least they don't telegraph it the yeah. way that they do the other jokes. Like, I appreciate the fact that it was at least like, oh, we're going to kind of throw this joke away. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it's still not very good, even if the no. joke were like, it's just a badly executed joke to begin with. And, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so there is a uh, prefet, uh, Geoffrion, yeah. um, who is like, you know, she's your boss, essentially. Yeah. You know, she does work for Interpol. And... Then we get sort of the big reveal of the plot because uh, yeah. Clouseau and Lisa are now on the same side and they track them down to some hideout. Yes. So they track them down to a hideout. There's like all manner of shenanigans here, which ultimately end up with Clouseau accidentally knocking out one criminal. Yeah. And then being knocked out himself while getting captured by another criminal who is then, he knocks Clouseau out, and then the criminal himself is knocked out, thus making Clouseau look like the hero again. But we see that it's Weaver. Yes. So Weaver's been the mole all along, and he puts some documents in the guy's, uh, the criminal's back pocket, along with, like, tickets to Zurich. Yeah. Right? Well, there's, so Switzerland. Uh, yeah, and so there, there's a bit, too, where Clouseau fires, like, this bow and arrow that hits the back of a TV. (laughs) And so he's hearing a bank heist being planned on a Western on television and right scribbling down all the details and throwing the notes down to Lisa and, and, and on the back of all of this, um, we get 
the scene where the actual criminals are meeting yeah. and we learn that oh surprise surprise the warden's son is actually johnny rainbow he's johnny rainbow oh and so the <laughs> so here's the big plan and the big plan is we are everyone has taken uh the Johnny Rainbow has taken this mold uh, at the Tudor arms yes. of Cluzo's face. And yes. so what they're going to do is they're going to rob 16 of the biggest banks in the world all at the same time. Yeah, all, all located just... in Zurich because Switzerland. Right. We'll because Switzerland no is the world's bank. Yeah, it's Switzerland is sitting up on a, a ton of nazi gold but we'll, but we'll get into that yeah and so <laughs> and but it, i actually like the 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 criminals plot which is we're all going to this is a bond this is a yeah. bond this is where we are right and interestingly this is not the only time we're going to take a swing at a kind of bond villain kind of plot idea thing here we're going to do it in one of the upcoming pink panther movies the difference being that when we do it in one of the upcoming Pink Panther movies, it's so over the top and so nonsense, it's a parody of it. It's like the Dr. Evil thing, which, I mean, totally, I can't imagine M uh, Michael Myers and, uh, and all the rest hadn't seen, like, one of these Pink Panther movies, the particular one that I'm thinking about, where, you know, like the, the layout is very much, you know, a million dollars, you know, it's, it's on that level. But this one here is in a... a goodness to gracious goldfinger-esque plot yeah where like we're going to rob all these banks and this is the perfect way to smuggle all the money out uh -huh. and no one will know it, and we're going to pin it on cluso because that's the running gag in all these movies as cluso ultimately ends up either the hero or in prison um one way or another but he's going to he's going to be our in because he is like investigating this he's going to be our in we can use him uh, we can use weaver's going to be there to back him up and um, we're going to use this mask to, to to get us through. So it's all like laid out. So you basically know what that right. Well, now at this point, you're you know a sigh, ah, a sigh is coming out because you know how the movie's going to end. Yeah. And we're like, we're, we just need to get through this. So I can see <laughs> now that I see that we have we have begun the third act proper, I yes. can I can at least feel like this will all be over soon. There will be an end, um, and I can't. I can't wait for that end to happen. Uh, hopefully, there's no more Scottish-based shenanigans or plane jokes. <clears throat> if only. Uh, right, what if, if only. we combine them, Duncan? I mean, it's like it's like it's like like you've mentioned before, but it's like cake and ice cream, two great flavors that are like disparate. But if you put them together, that's going to be a great time. Mm -hmm. Well, all mm. right. So we've got Clouseau. Then get ends up on a train to La Havre. Yes, and. We, do we need to do we need to talk about this scene, don't we, with these with the with the kids? I'll tell you, this is the other laugh I had in the movie. I, 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 did you laugh at them arguing? It's when they get really ferociously upset with each other. Yeah, about this is the, yeah that, that is that is a legitimately funny joke. Yeah, where the, you did not have the onesies, you know. Yeah, all right. That, so that like, is very yeah. absurd. So I don't know this game. So like, okay, so. Jax is essentially oops what places um yeah. Jax is essentially you you bounce the ball and while the ball is up in the air you swipe your hand to collect as many Jax as you can and then yeah. grab the ball before it hits again right. so right. so you know it's onesies twosies threesies however many Jax you get and cool. so Weaver shows up on on the train and the whole idea is he is going to get rid of Clouseau yes that's his job and then replace him and then replace him at this big meeting where he, you know, he is going to show up and essentially be security for mm -hmm. this big heist. And uh, so they, they have this intense game of jacks where they're arguing and like Weaver isn't very good at it. And yeah. so they're arguing about like, oh, did he get a onesie or not? Yeah, and, and Cluso was terrible at it as well. Yeah. And then, but there's the bit where the 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 train uh, the train conductor comes in and like, get out, get out, like yeah. like shouting at him because he's going to distract him. And then ultimately, what happens is Cluso, like Weaver, walks with Cluso 
like up the the aisle and then grabs him and physically throws him off the train. Right. He gets suspended on one of those old fashioned they don't exist anymore, but one of those old fashioned hooks that you would They're like, like mail hooks, right? Yeah. Yeah, you would collect bags of mail as your train was going along. Uh but he's stuck on one of those and then they bring in the replacement Clouseau who doesn't have a French accent, speaks upper middle class English. Um, and no one seems to notice. And it's just so Weaver and Johnny Rainbow is playing Clouseau. Yes. yes. And so they're telling the uh the the bankers, the heads of all these banks, that the best way to protect their money is to get them out of the banks and put them all mm. on these trucks. And again, the 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 whole plot is oh, it is Johnny Rainbow's men that are going to be piloting these trucks. So as soon as yeah. the money's loaded on there, they're going to steal all this money. Yeah. Once again, it's a very, it's a very gold finger sort of kind of plot to steal a lot of money. It does. It feels like lesser bond. And, um, but yeah, like, like I said before, Clouseau at this point now has a full English accent and no one's acknowledging it. Um, yeah. Nobody and, is like, Hey, what happened to your French accent? And why yeah. don't you sound like Alan Arkin anymore? And, and then like further to that, to differentiate the two, and this is mind boggling. Um, they put a lot of eyeshadow on the fake Clouseau's top eyelids, yeah. as well as the English accent, just in case the English accent wasn't a giveaway. Um, and I was, I, I was kind of just, I was wholly confused by all of this. Um, I just thought this is really stupid, but Clouseau at this point, uh, has you know he is desperately trying to warn everyone and make a call, but he goes to a phone booth and he doesn't have enough money. And the operator won't accept his call, so he starts peeling off buttons from his right. His oh, book. wait! Before uh, my mother has come by and given me some more coins and puts. Yeah, yeah. Puts he puts his buttons in, and they still don't allow him to make the call. So he then decides to go and steal money from a collection tin that he, none is running. And he manages to do that by trading his watch, which is maybe only a little waterproof, as he, qu he quantifies it to to her. Um, which once again, had that previous joke been set up really well, that would have that would have worked. But it didn't, so I don't give a fuck. So he manages to get the money from her, goes back. The guy basically tells him it's kaput um, because someone has put buttons in it, which has made it it's, kaput. Uh, uh, all right, also a pretty good joke because you've got a decent setup and payoff of him. Yeah, like yeah. you put the buttons in there and now it doesn't work. So... All right, so we're up to one and a half laughs per hour. Okay. Yeah, so like you're right. So like that you know, this is the thing. So Cluso is now kind of like I, I you know, I don't know what to do. Um I'm kind of stuck here. Meanwhile on the other side, the plan goes according to plan bo and the criminals get the fucking money. And of course everyone is a little bit upset about this because they believe Cluso is behind it all. Cluso is the master criminal. Um, so there's now a warrant out for Clouseau's arrest. This is surprisingly makes the papers very quickly. Um, because this is all still happening in the same day, but we have now papers being released and news reports about Clouseau the criminal. Um, I'm just like, this is dumb in any sense. And meanwhile, the money is being smuggled out in uh lint chocolate, which is a also I like I I like aspects of this script one of those things is hey we're bundling cool all idea. This st stolen money in wrappers of candy so it looks like we're yeah. just shipping candy and not yeah. money anyone and stops us anyone stops us we've got that there one of the guys in the room that's observing this lifts one of the bars and puts it in his pocket when no one's looking um and so ultimately he's brought in for questioning by these the zurich police mm -hmm. uh, and they also managed to get cluso they've sort of got cluso and cluso comes into the room and the guy's like, you need to empty your pockets to the, the guy who was at the, the crime scene. He starts taking everything out, including this bar of chocolate. And then Weaver comes in. And then Weaver's like, what's going on here? And they're like, oh, that's... So Weaver tries to steal the chocolate. The chocolate then opens up and it's revealed that it's money. Weaver runs out the door, right? Mm -hmm. They can't find Weaver. But Weaver then puts a Clouseau mask on because they must have loads of these. And uh, when he puts that mask on, his frame completely changes. It goes from being kind of like that to thin, like, yeah, oh, yeah. no, weird how that happens. Um, and then he comes in and then Clouseau and he have this fight. Um, you have my face, you have my face. It's like face off, face off, rip this off. You know, I have my face. Off. 
face off. Um, and they're having this like there's doves flying in the background, and John Woo's like, yeah. Uh, and um, they do this like the bees have this fight. The guy hits who he thinks is the right guy, but he ends up hitting Weaver, killing Weaver. It's revealed that Weaver's been involved with this. Cluso is completely confused by this, but he's ultimately set free to continue investigating the case. Which then leads to the next like gag, which I don't want. If there was something in my hand, I would have thrown it at the screen. Bo, that's how fucking angry I got. So Cluso's in his car, in like a like a packed kind of traffic jam, and our buddy Steel walks up and is like, "That why are you still wearing that Cluso mask?" Because he thinks it's been reported that Cluso died. Mm -hmm. Right. So why he's still wearing that mask? And close is like, aha, Steel, I got you. Now, that's right. But he doesn't. He can't find these handcuffs. So Steel's like, oh right, are they in your car? No. So he reaches in the car, grabs his keys, throws his keys away, and then Cluso still got his hand on him. Was like that? Well, if you go and get your keys, I'll just stay here. So Cluso lets go of his hand to go and get the keys. Steel runs away. No one laughed ever. Yeah, I mean, it's a terrible, terrible set of jokes. Yes, like, and there's a series of this. All this is that, like, this is the running set of series of jokes, and none of them land. Yeah, oh, it's just so bad. And all right, well, let's push through here. So ultimately, there, our criminals are going to get all of this stuff um, on a boat. On a boat, and uh, Clouseau uh, discovers, oh, they've got Lisa, so he's going to go after them to yeah. save her and. Uh, and and you know get get back all this money. He yeah. ends up being dragged. Uh, well, he up, ends up falling into the water, and yeah. he's wearing the inflatable vest, so right. it goes up. And then Steel, for whatever reason, inexplicable to me, hooks him and then takes him to the criminal group. I'm, I'm like, what would like? Why would you not just leave him there? Yeah, right. So, why are you taking him to everyone else? But they take him to everyone else, and it's revealed. Again, Bo, that big Johnny Rainbow was behind it all along, and he is the warden's son. Yeah, so they throw him, uh, throw Clouseau in the, you know, bowels of the ship along with Lisa, and he kind of freaks out a little bit, and she smacks him for good measure, and there's a, a again, an incredibly corny, like, oh, thank you, I needed that. Yeah. And Ugh. so he starts uh sets off his laser lighter. by accident once again he accidentally yeah. sets off his laser lighter as he's being pulled off the boat and what happens is it creates a hole in the boat so the mm -hmm. boat starts to sink right and so they're going to get rid of Clouseau and Lisa through some kind of means it seemed unclear to me why or how they're planning to dispose of them yeah, I think I the know. idea is we're going to throw them overboard and by the time anybody picks them up, we'll be long gone. Yeah. But then they discover that they're sinking. So everybody, you know, uh, peels off the ship and, yep. uh, but how on earth are Luzo and Lisa going to be rescued to alert the authorities as to what's going on? Oh, thank goodness. There is his, uh, cigarette case slash recorder. Yes. Which starts playing ambulance sounds and the sounds of police cars. And so a ship containing uh, Sir Charles and a bunch of other police officers hear this and they're like, oh, there they are. Let's get them on board. And then that's kind of it. Like they just mysteriously yeah. wrap up the crime. It's yeah, not the okay. last scene of the movie, but. Case solved it, Bo. Yeah, um... it's, it's a real kind of, you know, wet, wet fart. fart. Yeah. yeah, it's a hundred percent a wet fart ending. It's like it's terrible. Yeah, it's like I wanted to see what happened to all these criminals. Like the most interesting thing about the movie was the heist. Uh -huh. And once you know, once you've alerted the police, there's no like, ah, oh, you got me this time, Cluso, or or anything like that. Well, remember, a shot in the dark ends with all the all the criminals. Like you find that everyone's murdered someone rushing into a car which has been bombed, and they all explode. So that's finality yeah. to me. Yeah. As the audience, they're all dead, right? So yeah, it, and it's kind cool. of a fun gag of like, oh, yeah. oh, and by the way, this was a bomb intended for Cluso because yeah, such by a his dumb. boss yeah. who he's driven mad. Yeah, it, like it, weirdly, Bo. All the jokes in that pay off. Yeah. It's like they set that up uh, and it had a punchline 
and it was really well done. But no, no, Cluso's now at the airport with um, uh, Sir Charles, who's basically in no no kind of short terms here, basically telling him, don't come back. <laughs> like, but he's doing it in the nicest possible way. He's like, you know, it's been great working you. Like, don't feel that you have to come out. He's like, hey, if you ever need to head back and come back. And he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> we'll be yeah. fine without you. And you I'm know, like, if you are ever in uh, Paris, and you know, okay, yeah. all right, whatever. Just yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, mm. definitely going to do that, 100%. Um, and they say goodbye to him. He says goodbye to, to Lisa as well. He climbs up the stairs back on a plane. And right. I'm like, well, oh. she's going to, uh, theoretically, she is moving to Paris to be with him. She's going to live with him. She is in love with him. So yeah. once again, Clouseau has another bow at the end of this in, one. Inexplicably, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah, so. Uh, so he goes and sits on the plane. And the plane takes off, and I'm like, that, why? Oh, no. No, 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 no. Uh, and as he's sitting there, he uh, is revealed that there's someone sitting beside him. And the reveal of the person sitting beside him, Bo, is? Uh, it's the Widow Weaver, who is now freed of her relationship with the mole who uh, sellers, or not sellers, oh my god, uh, Clouseau <laughs> sellers, killed. Yeah. Yeah. If only. If only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so she's like, oh, dearie, why I'll be, we'll, we'll sneak off to the bathroom, we will. Yeah, and, she uh, opens her purse and out of her purse she pulls the most elaborate set of, the most complicated set of red underwear I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, it's my full corset number. Uh, and there's a wink. And then that's not the gag, though, Bo. No, 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 no. Uh, no. The gag is, like, as the plane is flying away, Clouseau parachutes out, and we hear him as he's drifting out, and then, no, I can't have the days, uh, like this, um, and that's the, the last joke. Yeah. And thankfully, and this movie's not that long, it's like 95, no. 100 minutes, something yeah, like that. but it felt oh. long, dude. How it, long did this movie feel for you? I mean, three-ish hours? Yeah, it, just... it's, it never moves. Yeah, it, there is nothing worse than an unfunny comedy. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and a movie is... that's clearly trying to be funny as well. That's the thing. Yeah. Like the they are like, and we said it before. Alan Arkin is is the, his his comic timing is really, really, really good. Yeah, like he's in the place for all the gags. The gags are just not funny though. Yeah, I mean, I I don't pin this on Alan Arkin. He is doing what he can with the character, but it's just it just doesn't work. Yeah. And and especially living in the shadow of Peter Sellers, who is so good in the role. Yeah, only four years before. That's yeah. the thing as well. It's it's not as if well, time has moved on and people have forgotten this. Is like we're talking nineteen sixty four to nineteen sixty eight, so it's still fresh in everyone's mind. In spectacle, so like Peter Sellers is still like Peter Sellers. He's a popular actor in the sixties, so like he's still out there doing. And then the fact that they also have a movie out where he's playing another bumbling character that's very, very funny. All these things work against it, and I just feel I don't know how. Like the thing is, I don't know if you you could have necessarily made like a great Clouseau movie, but you could have made a good one. I don't think it takes that much to make a good one. The jokes feel too elaborate in this one, and that misses the point of the previous movie whereas most of the jokes were very 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 small very 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 funny because they were all like i said before they were anticipated and that's kind of what makes them funny and, and this one here is like we are setting up this elaborate set of things to create a joke that never actually happens like when they're moving in the furniture or things that should be a lot funnier like the steering wheel gag mm -hmm. which you get no time to think about at all because it's there and it's done and it's consistently all the way through it, it's a very unfunny script as well. It's a very, very, very unfunny script. Like Ar Arkin, for the most part, plays the French accent like a French accent, whereas Clouseau in the previous movie, uh, Peter Sellers had started playing, but it gets more elaborate as the series goes on, but by mispronunciating things mm -hmm. in a comedic way. You know what I mean? Where people, I am an officer of the loo. And they're like an officer of the the, the what? And an officer of the loo. Uh, you know what I mean? Like th these these things. And this one, Arkin doesn't do any of that. So it's a, essentially a relatively authentic fake accent, but it's not it's not played for humor. So like you're even losing that aspect. So it's not even as if his delivery could create humor. It's it's just it's a, it's such a weird oddity of a movie because 
it almost doesn't work on any level when you step back and look at it. It's like a failure across the board. Yeah, it, it's a right. It, it it's a real misfire on every count. Yeah, yeah. They don't yeah. get anything really right at all. And, and once again, it's not to take away from the performances. The performances are what they are, but it, it just is like nothing here really works. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it's a it's a real shame because I, I like Alan Arkin could have been a decent enough replacement. Again, you're kind of living in the shadow of Sellers, and and he's just so good in the role. And and. Yeah. Uh, but, and Alan Arkin has a, a has had a very long and successful career after this, so this did not right. kill him, right? Yeah. Like, so we have to we have to kind of stress that the, like the good the dude did the right thing. He put this to the back and just powered on, right? <laughs> and not- you know, in a movie I complained about recently, that new Minions movie, like he's still doing voice work and and still showing up in movies and that kind of thing. So like he's had a long and storied career, and and uh, is it the the out of towners or the in laws? One of those. The original, maybe it was the original in laws. We mm. said him and Peter Falk. Um, oh wow, yeah. Um, let me let me figure this out. But yeah, like he and Little Miss Sunshine. He's tremendously funny in that. I forgot for a second that he was in Argo, and he's terrific in Argo. He's one of those guys that can play like the street side of things very well as well. You know yeah, I mean? the in-laws. Like, yeah, sure enough, he is. He is. It's. Uh, if you've never seen it, Alan Arkin and Peter Falk in the in-laws, tremendously funny movie. Um, where, you know, they are the the titular in-laws, and it turns out that Peter Falk is kind of a secret agent. Yeah, and and Alan Arkin as the straight man of the movie ends up being kind of sucked into this whirlwind adventure. And mm-hmm. it's it's a wonderful movie. It's very 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 funny. Um. So yeah, uh, you know, this is not to impugn the good name. Of it Alan did Arkin. not like I, this. Did not do like um, the aforementioned Mike Myers, who did that the Guru movie, and that basically ended his career for like a decade and a decade and the rest. Oh um, yeah, sure. Like a- after Inspector Clouseau, I you know he was in Catch Twenty Two a couple of years later, and he yeah. was great in that. And then yeah, swung right, swung right back hard. So, right. but but we as viewers would have to wait. Let's see, seven two, seven, yeah. seven years until we get the Return of the Pink Panther, which once again just starts like they go back to basics. We get Blake Edwards back, we get Peter Sellers back, who are on technically the dim swing at this point. I don't think Blake Edwards had done anything hugely successful for a while, and Peter Sellers maybe wasn't as popular as he had been. Like we're now past the point of a uh, Doctor Strange love, so you know he's he's kind of he's starting to feel that maybe things are starting to slip away. So we go back to what we know, and we return to the return of the Pink Panther, which we'll see as once a be, once again be reunited with uh, Sir Charles. This time played by Christopher Plummer because uh, David Niven did not want involved with the project. Mm-hmm. Um, so they recast him. They recast his like Cluso's wife, I think, is recast as well. Uh, so the original actress doesn't come back for that because she's now married to Sir Charles. Um, but you do get a lot of the familiar faces. So we are going to get uh, Herbert Lom returns. We're going to get Burt Quark returns as Cato. So we get a ton of these people that will make me very happy. It is also. It's a it's a return to form. It's like a, like you're gonna you're gonna, and this is the first one where you get like the full on, like exact like the beginnings of the full on exaggerated Cluso accent. Like Sellers comes back strong, and it has the the infamous monkey scene with the guy with the accordion. Is there there's a minky on your shoulder? <laughs> the guy's like, I I want. He's like a minky. He says monkey is that is what I said. I said a minky. Um, like so like we're gonna start going down that road. And things get this one is is is, he, is a little bit out there, but it's fun. The one that comes after that is fucking bonkers. So I, I can't I'm, wait I'm to get super back. Super excited, to, man! Yeah. Super excited. Uh, all right. Well, before we get to the return of the Pink Panther and all its minkies, <laughs> Minky? uh, <laughs> uh, where could people check out more of your stuff, Duncan? Uh, please check me out on podcast under the stairs we are officially at the point of recording this halfway through the summer series so 20 episodes out 20 still to go i have officially finished recording me and bo wrapped up the final episode 
uh, yesterday. So this has been a, a weekend of Duncan and Bo, and I've been living it. Um, always feel spoiled Excellent. when I get you a whole weekend to myself, but yeah. I'm I'm a greedy that way. It's, uh, it's but like yeah. that winter cabin we shared that <laughs> that wonderful Christmas. <laughs> the winter cabin that we promised never to talk about again. Oh. Um, <laughs> did I do that? <laughs> um, so, oops. Uh, so yeah, like please, please show some love over there. Um, I'm currently putting out about five or six episodes a week on that feed just for summer series and all the other various bits and bobs. But uh, yeah, check that one out. Uh, Teapots Collective is coming back in force in September. Um, summer series always kind of constricts the amount of time I can give to that channel but you are getting loads this month on that, you'll be getting Where to Begin With which will see the Maltese Falcon uh, be reviewed um, and then passed off to the listeners to review uh, doing the nasty, continuing the run of nasty stuff that I'm doing with uh, Mark Ball, uh, Chronicle I'm returning with that with a solo episode looking at uh, Butter Geast's um, Scram which is a movie a lot of people have not seen. They like kind of switched off after Necromantic, but um, after Necromantic 2, he did a movie about a German serial killer. Uh, and it is deeply weird and highly disturbing. So that, that's, uh, that'll that be getting covered. And uh, Opera Omnia is coming back with Alex Garland as the, the subject matter. And uh, JP from the 22 Shots is coming on to do all three of those reviews with me, of which... He has never seen Ex Machina, so I am super oh, curious. Oh wow! That, that movie is fucking great. Yeah, um, yeah. I think so. Man, I yeah. think Men is maybe my favorite Garland film, even though I'm, I'm with on that I one. I think I think Men is like across the board the best thing he's done, and weirdly, it's the most direct movie he's done mm -hmm. of all his yeah. stuff. You know, what I mean, he didn't he he didn't water down his art house vibes and aesthetics to put the message at the forefront. Whereas in other movies, I think sometimes his messaging can get a little bit muddled and some of the, the visuals, but yeah, I'm with you. I think men's his best. So uh, we'll see if uh, if young Mr. GP agrees with me when he, he joins me on that. Everything I do, though, can be found at tputzcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Fantastic. And uh, if you want more out of me, uh, head over to legionpodcast.com where you can find The Dark Parade, which is all the horror stuff I do. Um, and... Uh, I, I'm still doing a once a week show there, although being back in school has created mm. uh, a little bit of a time suck because uh, not only do I have to actually go to class, I have to, <laughs> I have to do homework and reading and all that stuff. You're not my real mom. Yeah. Um... Call me sometime when you have no class. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh I yeah just, i love this idea i just love this idea you sitting with like a group of like 20 year olds going like gee mr steven's a real drag am i right anyone am i right yeah I'm like, hello fellow children uh, <laughs> yeah there are a couple of other like non-traditional students uh in, in the class so I've, i'm not alone in being the old guy in the room Mature um, is, I believe, what they call you. A mature student. Well, that's what they call them over here. I don't know if that's what they call them over there. Yeah, non-traditional so is is generally how it's termed. Um, yeah, there's. I think there's one person. I've only got two classes. I think there's someone older than me in one of them, and I'm the older. I'm the oldest one in the other class in the linguistics class. Um, mm. But it, you know, it's it's fun, and you know, I'm I am cool enough and hip enough. That uh, the children love me, Duncan. It is. <laughs> as, as Maya's kids have voted me into the house and her out of the house. Uh, although it's, I mean, we're working on how that's going to, uh, how that it was inevitable, is going to happen. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was inevitable. Yeah, I'm the nice one just because I don't have any authority to punish them yet. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, someday, someday that, that may come. And when it does, yeah. my popularity is going to yeah. just crater. I believe they call that a reckoning bull. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my Q scores is going to go way down. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, but I'm still doing once a week on the, on the dark parade. Uh, sometimes that's review. Sometimes, um, that is, uh, you know, movie show. Sometimes it's Heart of Horror. Sometimes it's yeah. the What You Watching. It's it's kind of a grab bag, but w every Wednesday you are getting something new uh, over there. Oh, and uh, and then all there's Pick Six movies, which we talked about in this episode with me and my buddy Chad. That comes out every two weeks, 
and uh of course the you're still doing the michael creighton CD. yeah we're we're wrapping that up we just did runaway the tom Selleck gene simmons movie i've never seen that it, it dude you absolutely ought to watch it is like is, is this a, like a recommend and that it's it's good, it's or? not terrible it's really interesting and especially if you have any interest in that kind of near future sort of movie where it's not set in the you know like 2187 or anything right but it gets a crazy amount of things right about what future technology would hold Give me a like, 30 second synopsis. What's that about? Okay, so Tom Selleck and his partner work for a division within the police that are there to essentially stop runaway robots. And most of the time, it's just like, oh. hey, this robot has blown a circuit and you don't want to let the common people deal with this thing because, you know, they, they're potentially harmful. Yeah. Um, Gene Simmons is the evil Dr. Luther who um, has strong-armed some people into developing um, smart bullets. All right. Which, which, again, the movie predicted the actual, of you know, uh, invention of smart bullets. And so Tom Selleck realizes that uh, he is uh, basically, Dr. Luther has these chips that if inserted into domestic robots, turn them into killing machines. Mm. So you can essentially assassinate anyone you want to through their domestic robot. Sold. Sold. And, I will check that out. It's him. It's Kirstie Alley. Oh, I like Kirstie Alley as well. Yeah. Well, you and, know Kirstie Alley. Wait, I think Kirstie Alley is a bit fucking nuts. Sure. No, this is pre-Cheers Kirstie Alley. And, oh, wow. Yeah, right. Uh, it's like right after she did. It's same year as uh, Star Trek Three, as a matter of fact. Oh, amazing. Right. And uh, right. yeah. And so Gene Simmons, uh, G.W. Bailey, who you may remember as Lieutenant Harris from the Police Academy movies, yeah, is yeah, the yeah. police chief. Oh, uh, and but it's pretty good. It, it's a it's a pretty good movie. And there are these robot spiders that uh, Gene Simmons uses to assassinate people. That's that are pretty cool. Um, so that's an interesting movie. And we just wrapped that one up. That'll be out Friday um, mm -hmm. a, as we're recording this. And the last one we're doing is The Lost World, that first Jurassic Park season. Oh goody! Yeah, which is not a great movie. Um, no, so it, it really has it really has a message that it like really, 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 really doesn't try at all to hide. No, and you know it's a movie that would not exist with like it is a movie based on a book that would not have been written yeah. if Jurassic Park the movie had become been huge. as successful. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's just a mess. Like there was there's no heart or soul in any yeah. of it. Dude, I'm about to do I'm about to do the uh Russian roulette franchise retro on the Hannibal Lecter movies. Oh wow. And that's literally the story of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Although for better or worse, some of those turn out like Tom Harris surprisingly gets Hannibal, the book anyway, not the movie. Uh the book really, really well. I love I love that book actually. I love the ending mm -hmm. of that book. But that Hannibal Rising book is just like the movie and the book. Utter shite. I've um, read that. I I've I've read oh, up to Hannibal, but a Hannibal Rising. He I is strong armed it. into writing that. He was yeah. told that if he because the rights and all the rest were with the uh, with the studio, he was told if you do not write this, we will write it ourselves. So he wrote it, and it like, almost feels like a spite write. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> He's yeah, just yeah. like, oh, well, fuck you guys then. Is this what you want? Katana bleeds. Uh, <laughs> it's like a Pacino from a uh, set of a woman. <laughs> Studio, well, fuck you too. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll write your book. Hooah. Hooah. If I, uh, if I if I were a younger man, I'd take a flamethrower to this library. Oh, uh, did did like I, I, some of those lines are amazing. Uh, I will say the one thing we will say before we get here: if you like me and Bo doing longer form stuff, we have announced it is happening. Uh, our director's conversation for podcasts under the stairs this year, coming at the end of the year, and uh, talk about Pacino at Powerhouse performances. She's got a great ass. Yeah. Um, yeah, we are going to be we're going to be doing Michael Mann, which I I originally started doing that on Opera Omnia way back in the day and yeah. never finished. So this is like unfinished business for me. And there's at least three movies in his back catalogue I've never seen before. But it does mean that we get to talk about Thief. We will discuss Manhunter, 
Last of the Mohicans, Heat, The Insider, like just like Collateral, which I watched recently, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. A, well, it's a, holds up surprisingly well. I'm, I'll tell you, I'm excited about going back to Last of the Mohicans because I love that movie, and it's been yeah. years since I've seen. It's it. It's really good. Like I watched it a couple of years ago for that series, and I remember like seeing it as a kid and really liking it, and then watching it then going. Yeah, Daniel Day Lewis is just fucking awesome. <laughs> he really is. He really does deserve all those Oscars, Bo. <laughs> I will find you no matter what occurs. And then the score and all. Yeah, that, so that like scene we're... with West Duty, the thing I, I think about yeah. whenever I think about Last of the Mohicans, it's the scene where he's stretch West Duty is stretching out his hand to the the colonist girl. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. camera is like spinning around before she throws herself yeah. off. It's like. Man, this scene is just so good. It, like the- he's a great director. He's yeah. in fucking power. He's a he's another. He's a, he's almost on that kind of. He's someone I always think about in the same terms as as Fincher, even though he's not as consistent as Fincher. Mm-hmm. But like Michael Mann to me is auto director. The conversations we're going to have on that show are going to be insane. The conversation about Heat alone, which is in my top, like is easily in my top twenty movies ever fucking made i like love that movie the fact we get to talk about that me you and doug yeah. get to talk about fucking heat on a podcast yeah. and doug's like i don't know if it'll be you know but we'll be seven hours like like with the freaking episode i was like we could be seven hours just on heat that's gonna be a, a, another movie that i haven't seen in forever and i just remember oh, loving man. but i just you know like heat's a commitment that's a a monster of a film and I just, uh, it's just got that 4k as well that no, 4k I, just come out and oh, oh. <laughs> guess who's gonna be buying some 4ks pretty soon uh and and like i i can't wait to watch thief again thief like i can't thief is thief incredible and yeah oh, no so you did yeah thief thief to me is i'd like i i think i don't want to give too much away i think thief might be in my top three that he's made i think thief is like absolutely it's, james can is yeah. fucking incredible you've got tangerine dream doing the score it's just like it's just it's a duncan wet dream it's yeah. just like hits me on all these different levels so yeah, it's um, god tier jimmy Khan to be yeah, sure we, uh, we we are gonna have the best time doing that so yeah that's what you have to look forward to end of the year myself Bo, and the 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 evil genius that is doug tilly yeah. yeah, lover of everything science crazed. We'll be sitting down and uh, and doing all that. So the countdown, I dare say, on the and the Duncan and Bose leading up to that, occasionally we'll talk about revisits to Michael Mann movies and our best and worsts. For sure, for sure. All right, uh, enough of this business. Let's get out of here. Uh, only thing left to do is to say to my good pal Duncan, say good night, Duncan. Say to my good pal Duncan, say good night, Duncan. Whoa. <laughs> a flame thought to this fucking movie. That's what <laughs> someone should have done that to fucking the spectacle. So, oh boy, the fucking negatives. Take a flame thrower. Yeah, you have a minky on your flame thrower. Done.